Testing, one, two, three, four. Check, check, one, two, three, four. Thank you very much for the test.
get things started, uh, we'll call to order the Property and Facilities Committee meeting of uh, the Board of Regents State of Iowa. Uh, if you would note, please, who is here in attendance. First agenda item is the mini minutes of the June 2nd, 2021 committee meeting. Are there any questions or comments or additions or deletions there? Okay, thanks, hearing none. Those will be approved by consensus. Our next item is the Register of University of Iowa Capital Improvement Business Transactions. Ron Leonards. Thank you, Regent Dokovich and fellow Regents. Uh, the University of Iowa has three projects associated with the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics. The first of the three projects is a uh, request for permission to proceed with project planning for the expansion of the UIHC emergency power generation facility. This will replace two diesel generators in the main hospital. Uh, with a single larger generator located on the facility that was built in 2016 between the Finkbein commuter parking lot and the Finkbein golf course. When we designed that project, we designed for it to be expanded as would be needed in the future. The existing diesel generators in the hospital uh, atop and serving the uh, Roy Carver Pavilion and the Pomerantz Family Pavilion are more than 40 years uh, old and are beyond their anticipated useful life. So this will be a project that will increase efficiencies, reliabilities, and um, as a remote site, it also attends to emergency situations where, for instance, in a tornado, and part of the reason that we, we located it where we did and in a hardened facility is so that we can make sure that we have emergency generation when most needed at the hospital. Um, uh, this project is one that, um, again, permission to proceed with planning would be funded by university um, hospital usage funds, and the current uh, pre-planning estimate is 30 to 35 million dollars. So, Rod, this is just a curiosity question. Can, can you get the kilowatts you need with a different type of fuel, like natural gas? Uh, we can study that the existing, both at the, at the current site and at the site, the new R diesel, uh, there is a... Uh, I don't know if natural gas is available when those were put in, though. Yeah, no, that's true. And the, the design team will certainly be studying those options as we go forward. And there are multiple factors to consider, including immediate startup or instant startup for those cases, as well as um, uh, store fuel uh, receiving uh, and consistency on that front. But the, all of those issues in projects like this will be studied as we begin the planning process. So I was just curious, how often have you had to use power from the generators for emergency? Uh, well, we emergency test it regularly, have right. not had to. It was, had to. it was installed as part of the process for the Children's Hospital expansion uh, to UIHC and is there for uh, emergency within the hospital but and or uh, weather emergencies that would occur. It has not for an emergency basis uh, been needed. We obviously test it regularly. And it's one of those things, it's not needed until it's really needed, That's especially right. related, to, um, related to the hospital functions. Yep. yep. Okay. All right, no Here further no questions. questions. Yep. I will uh, move on to the second project, which is a uh, request for approval of the schematic design and budget for the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics John Colleton Pavilion Expand Observation Unit. It's a 15,000 square foot project in the lower level of the John Colleton Pavilion will create observation unit for orthopedic and emergency department patients. Uh, the project budget, uh, $13,430,000, uh, will be funded by university hospital usage uh, funds. Um, this will create 30 new patient observation rooms and um, an important part of the process for uh, delivery of care for those um, in, 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 in and associated with those two parts of the hospital, um, both emergency and orthopedic. Um, additionally, as is noted in your docket information, depending on the results and the f of the bidding and the, f and the funding, we are including a bid alternate um, that could upgrade roofing, roof insulation, and pavers in the courtyard above this part of, of the hospital. And um, uh, the current intended schedule for the project, we would start construction in the fall of this year, 2021, completion in the winter or the end of 2022. 
Questions and on that project? It, one clarification sure. I'll make because it's often a question that 15,000 square feet made available was when we did the sterilization project out on the Oakdale campus that made this space which was occupied by local sterilization operations available was as we vacated that space and moved to Oakdale. So that's how the space becomes available for the central function. Thank you. And our third project, also UIHC, this is also a request for approval of the schematic design and budget for the Palm Ranch <coughs> family, excuse me, family pavilion. And this is <coughs> a project to expand uh, cancer centralized intake. Uh, this is a 2,900 square foot uh, waiting space on level one of the Palm Ranch family pavilion, uh, 13 intake bays, a project that is, um, uh, has a budget of two point uh, to eight million dollars uh, funded by hospital usage funds. Uh, you can see in some of the background the amount of coverage and the amount of, of patient uh, traffic um, in and as uh, associated with the Holden comprehensive cancer patients is as many as 300 to 350 visits associated with that part of the hospital each day and seven as, as it says 75 percent of those patients requiring intake uh, lab work and so you can imagine how important this part of the hospital operation is for our patients and for the care of the patients in the whole in the Holden comprehensive uh, cancer uh, center. This will be a project that will include the basic construction in that area, including uh, and, and including walls, HVAC, and the systems associated with it, as well as equipment and furniture. Um, this project would also start construction this fall, 2021, and be completed by summer uh, 2022, roughly, roughly a nine-month construction project. Uh, question on that project or any of the three that Rod has submitted? Questions, comments? Okay, hearing none. Thank you, Rod. Those will be, those are approved by consensus and will be put to the full board later. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, University of Iowa proposed naming. Certainly, thank you. Um, I, as, as is typical for a naming, in this case an honorary naming, I'll read a prepared statement so that it's in the minutes. I also want to recognize that uh, Senior Associate Athletic Director Barbara Burke is here today. She'll be reporting at the end of the Board of Regents meeting, but this is a, a, a naming uh, obviously uh, important to the athletic department and to the University of Iowa, so I wanted to point out that Barbara is with us today. Uh, the University of Iowa is seeking approval from the Board of Regents State of Iowa to name the playing field of Kinnick Stadium in the honor of Duke Slater. Duke is recognized as one of the greatest players in Iowa football history and was a pioneer breaking through racial barriers both as a football player and throughout his professional life. Duke Slater grew up in Clinton, Iowa and played tackle for the Iowa Hawkeyes from 1918 to 1921. He was the first black student athlete in school history to earn All-American honors. He was a three-time first team All-Big Ten selection and competed for the Iowa Hawkeyes in football as well as track and field. Iowa had a 7-0 Big Ten record in 1921, his final year with the Hawkeyes, claiming the conference title, and the team was named by more than one media out outlet as national champion that year. Slater was the first black player inducted into the National Football Foundation College Hall of Fame in 1951. Slater was elected to the National Iowa Varsity Club Hall of Fame in 1989, and in 1951 was one of five members named to the inaugural class of the Iowa Sports Hall of Fame. Duke Slater is now also a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, being elected as a member of the Centennial class in 2020. Slater earned two degrees from the University of Iowa. He studied law while playing football in the NFL and eventually earned his Juris Doctor degree from Iowa. Following the NFL, he enjoyed a successful career, which culminated in being named the first black judge to serve on the Cook County uh, Superior Court in Chicago, Illinois. Slater Residence Hall, located on the west side of our campus, was named in Duke's honor in 1972. A relief sculpture of Slater throwing a key block in the 1921 victory over Notre Dame is featured outside of our new north end zone at Kinnick Stadium. Duke Slater died on August 14, 1966, at the age of, six, of 67. The University of Iowa believes the naming of Duke Slater Field at Kinnick Stadium is the proper capstone 
to honor a remarkable Hawkeye and a remarkable citizen of our state. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Any questions or comments on that? <clears throat> Rod, when you get a minute, could you send me your write-up? Absolutely. Get any Certainly. questions from the media? Certainly. Thank you. Okay. Hearing none, that is approved by consensus. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to the register of the Iowa State University Capital Improvement Business Transactions, Pam. Thank you, Chair Dokovich. Um, Iowa State University comes for the committee to get permission to proceed with planning for the Gilman Hall renovation. Um, the academic buildings along the Osborne corridor of campus house our physical sciences programs at the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Gilman Hall is one of the largest academic buildings on campus. Um, what we want to do is improve spaces used by students and faculty to support programmatic needs of teaching and research for the chemistry and psychology departments and address a significant portion of critical deferred maintenance in this aging facility. The renovation will modernize between 34,000 and 36,000 net assignable square feet or about 65,000 gross square feet. Um, we have a need for faculty and graduate student offices, research lab space focused on physical, analytical, and computational chemistry. Um, a portion of the space currently in Gilman is underutilized due to the poor condition of the building's infrastructure. So by renovating this underutilized space will enable us to reduce the impact of the project in, on current building re residents. Um, the psychology department currently occupies space in five different buildings, primarily along Osborne Drive, and this space will consolidate some of the scattered psychology faculty, staff, graduate students, and instructional and research space into this renovated space in Gilman. So um, by eliminating part of that backlog and modernizing the building space, um, it's renewing core components of the building, infrastructure, improving the restrooms, creating high quality space for chemistry and psychology departments, and renovating a portion of the general university classrooms and updating common areas. Big, big project. So. Um, it's approximately going to be 35 to $40 million. We will be doing it over time. And we also request permission to consider the use of alternate delivery methods, which we believe have um, many advantages and provide best value and managed risk for the project. Thank you. Has anybody put a pencil to the deferred maintenance dollars that this will uh, eliminate? Yes, I do have that. I don't remember it off the top of my head. I think it's about $34 million. I was thinking that was the total. Well, that's um, 30, the deferred maintenance is almost $34 million. But for the, for, for the total billing? Uh, correct, in the total billing. Of, yeah. yes. um, I guess my question was, you, you never get a one for one. You got a $34 million, you got a 35 to $40 million project, and it never gets that no. close to one to one. I just wondered how much was gonna be eliminated with the modernization. That I don't know. I will find out though. Just, cur just curious. Oh. Uh, other questions, comments? Okay. Thank Hearing you. None. Thank you. That is approved by consensus. Uh, one easement. Michael, you're up next. In November 2019, the board approved permission to proceed with project planning for an expansion to the Gallagher Blue Dorn Center. During that process, we uh, discovered the gas line does not match the easement, and we think it's good to line those up. Uh, so this is permission to move the easement from the old location to where the gas line actually is. In exchange, we'll receive a token $1 from the city, which we don't think to material impact to the budget. No, that's right. Questions or comments on that? <laughs> okay, that is improved by consensus. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our agenda. Is there any other business that come before this committee? Okay, hearing none, thank you. We're adjourned.
morning, everyone. This is the Academic Affairs Committee. Uh, we will dispense with roll call, but I would do want to welcome our new provost here, Jose Herrera. Uh, if you care to say a few words, you're welcome to do that. We are delighted to have you here. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I've been benefiting from Iowa kindness for the last three weeks. Ah, Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. We are sure you will enjoy your time here. Thank you. And we have uh, a Provost Kevin Craigel and uh, Associate Provost Don Brach Prince with us today. So thank you all for being here. Uh, our first item is approval of the Academic Affairs Committee meetings. Are there any additions or corrections to those meetings from the June meeting? Seeing none, no. stand approved then. Um, the next item is from the Iowa State Provost Brach Prince. Will you please yes. take the floor? Thank you. So we have a proposal for um, a program termination, a Master of School Mathematics. And Iowa, our College of Human Sciences requests permission to terminate this master's degree in school mathematics, um, which has seen a gradual decline in enrollment following the elimination of collective bargaining for Iowa teachers. It was previously beneficial to high school teachers to obtain master's degrees in their discipline for promotion and career advancement. I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's no longer the case. Um, and so there have been um, a decline in student, and you have the data, in, I believe, in the report. Uh, over the last five years, you've seen a dramatic decrease in student enrollment and several retirements of our faculty that used to teach in this summer program. Um, and there's one student right now who would like to complete the program. They're at the final stage, and we're able to accommodate that student. Um, individuals interested in this type of a degree program can be um, served by University of Northern Iowa, which offers a master's degree in math with a secondary teaching emphasis. So um, the need is, it, the, um, there, there's a program there that can fulfill that need. Any questions on that program? Okay, seeing none, then do you want to go ahead with the yeah. new program? And you can hear me without too much feedback now. Sorry. Okay. Uh, we're also proposing at Iowa State, uh, our Ivy College of Business is pro proposing a master's degree in healthcare analytics and operations. And this is a 30 credit program that will be delivered uh, primarily online uh, to provide advanced concepts and training for Iowa healthcare leaders. So it's a program meant for uh, really for working professionals. We envision the program will be of interest to companies that want to invest in their workforce. Um, and we have conducted interviews and surveys with current healthcare industry leaders. So this proposal is really um, informed by, uh, by, by uh, real-time research. Um, in terms of, terms of other programs, we know that the Tippy College at the University of Iowa offers a grad certificate in healthcare management but there's no overlapping required courses between the two programs and both the University of Iowa and the University of Northern Iowa have offered letters of support for this new um, program which we, which we appreciate. Um, in terms of enrollment, we expect to start with 15 majors the first year and we're projecting by year seven to have approximately 60 students. And as I mentioned, these will primarily be working professionals who um, are already working in the healthcare delivery and management um, uh, area. The financial resources needed for this program will come from tuition revenue. Um, so we do envision that the program will be self-sustaining. And we've submitted the program to the Iowa Coordinating Council back in May, and it's um, received all the necessary institutional uh, endorsements and approvals. So um, we seek your approval for this new program. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns? Yes. Uh, just one question. You mentioned that there were professionals already in the field. Just curious if the courses will be in the evenings to accommodate, or will they keep working, or do you anticipate that they would you know, take a step back from their career? No, I think this will be a program that would um, align with the work um, hours, work needs of, of um, you know, currently working professionals. And so it's an online program, and I imagine some of it might be 
asynchronous, some of it might be synchronous. There might be some um, in-person component to it, but yeah, the, the audience is individuals who are actually working in the, in the field right now. Any other questions or comments? Okay, if there's no objections, then the Academic Affairs Committee will recommend approval of the termination of the Master of School um, Mathematics program and approval of a new program in Master of Healthcare Analytics and Operations at Iowa State. Thank you. Thank you. The next uh, items come from the University of Iowa, Provost Kriegel. Thank you, Regent Butker. I am going to um, ask our brand new Dean of the Graduate College, Amanda Tyne, to join us and go through our proposals. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, everyone. Uh, the University of Iowa requests to terminate the International Executive MBA program with Hong Kong Learning Center. The Hong Kong MBA program is an alternative learning center for the Tippi College of Business's professional MBA program. The program was opened in 2002. Students in the program take the same course requirements as those of the professional MBA program in Iowa. The reason for the proposed termination is a, is, is a decrease in class size to enrollment levels that can't sustain a robust academic atmosphere. Demand for the program initially became more challenging as the MBA market grew saturated with other quality US-based MBA programs, as well as growth within well-respected local universities like the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Then in 2019, the widespread political unrest coupled with the emerging coronavirus pandemic further decreased enrollments. Safety concerns coupled with concerns about the learning environment led the Tippy College to decide to indefinitely suspend courses and applications in spring 2020. The elected faculty council and a review by the Tippy Global Task Force have made their recommendation to move to the suspension to a permanent closure of the program. All students who were actively enrolled in the program in spring 2020 were given completion options through the Tippy Online MBA program and have since graduated with their degrees. Those not actively taking courses or who had previously withdrawn will be offered a plan to graduate should they ask to return to complete their MBA. Thank you. Are there any questions or concerns? Regent Parker? Thanks. Um, I'm just wondering how the uh, Italy program is doing. Are you having difficulties there also? Or? I'm not sure I have a good answer to that. I would okay. have to look further into it. I think they're, they are doing well with the Italy program and hoping to continue to expand that. Okay, it's a great program. I taught mm -hmm. in it once. Yeah. Um, but uh, are there any other international programs that you have, or is that it? Do you know, Kevin? That's it. That's the primary. I think that's the primary that's it. one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay. Then let's move on to the program name change. Sure. The University of Iowa requests to change the name of the Master of Arts in Journalism to the Master of Arts in Mass Communication. The reason for the proposed change is that the name journalism is no longer a representative title for careers that the Master of Arts program prepares students for. Students associate the term journalism with a professionally focused program that will prepare them to gain applied skills to become better journalists, editors, and media producers. However, the makeup of the faculty no longer aligns with this identity, and as a, re as a result, the program has become more focused on media research training. These misalignments create issues for graduate recruitment and retention. Making this change to the program name will improve the match between student expectations and experiences, as well as the caliber of students applying to the MA program. There are no planned changes to program configuration. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Okay, then there are no objections, and the Academic Affairs Committee will recommend approval of termination of the executive MBA in Hong Kong, the program name change for the Master of Arts Journalism and the new program in Master of Science in Sustainable Development. Oh, we haven't done that one yet. Yes, yeah, sorry, I missed that one. Would you please go ahead with the uh, new yes. program in Master of Science? Sure. Uh, the University of Iowa requests to create a new Master of Science in Sustainable Development program. The MS in Sustainable Development will be an interdisciplinary graduate program located in the Graduate College. The program was developed by faculty in the School of Planning and Public Affairs in the Graduate College. 
the Department of Geographical and Sustainable Sciences in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and the Sustainable Water Development Graduate Program in Civil and Environmental Engineering. The program is centered on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and will prepare graduate students for technical and policy leadership roles in the private and public sector to advance the sustainable development of communities in Iowa, across the United States, and around the world. No similar programs exist in the state of Iowa. Through already established undergraduate programs at U, at U Iowa focused on sustain, sustainability, we see steadily increasing demand for more and graduate level content training in this area. So for example, the undergraduate sustainability certificate program has maintained high enrollment numbers and sustained growth since its creation in 2009. Since its inception, UI has awarded 466 sustainability certificates to participating undergraduates in the program. The undergraduate sustainability sciences major in just its second year of existence has 29 students enrolled in the program and is currently exceeding all expectations for program growth. The proposed MS will not duplicate any existing programs at other colleges and universities in Iowa. Iowa State University is the most likely university in Iowa to offer sustainability programming. Therefore, the program sought broad feedback during the proposal development from relevant programs at ISU with sustainability components in their programs. All programs were supportive of the proposed MSSD and indicated no concern for potential overlap. Um, graduates of the program will obtain employment across a variety of sectors that intersect with sustainability um, and sustainable development. These include jobs in public service, at local, state, and federal levels in all areas related to the environment and private sectors as consultants for industries seeking to improve the sustainability of their operations and processes in the private sector, including chief sustainability officer, director of sustainability, and sustainability project manager or coordinator, which are positions of growing importance at both large and small companies alike. And in global development, working internationally with NGOs and other organizations that strive to advance sustainable development goals worldwide. Degree recipients will also be well positioned to pursue additional graduate studies toward PhD, MBA, or JD degrees. Funding for the program development will come from an existing NSF NRT grant for sustainable water development and a graduate college challenge grant focused on interdisciplinary graduate program innovation. Are there any questions or comments concerning this new program? Okay, seeing none then, um, we will recommend um, approval of the new program in Master of Science in Sustainable Development. Thank you, thank you. Next we have, uh, uh, we will receive the update on financial literacy uh, at the universities, and that will be Rachel Boone. Thank you, Regent Bucker. I want to share this uh, brief, very brief update with you, and, and the docket shared the majority of this information, but I want to highlight a couple of things today. Um, as we are now about four years into the, um, re since the Regents initiated this um, requirement with the universities, so I want to give you a, sort of a, a quick um, update on where that stands and some changes that are on the horizon. Um, there was a slight dip in participation this year, primarily due to not being able to hold any in-person trainings. Financial literacy trainings have been done both through online uh, platforms as well as in person. Um, so of course there was some impact of that from the pandem pandemic, excuse me. Um, but there were still nearly 10,000 students at the universities participated in this training in the last year, which is really strong participation. Um, the universities have continued to find really creative ways to engage with students um, in, in addition to this financial literacy training. So I think that there's a lot of really positive work happening in that area. Um, and some of it's in really traditional ways like loan counseling. Um, and they've seen great success in monitoring private loans in particular, reducing, finding um, ways to save students um, from from borrowing as much and being able to reduce their loan debt. So there's been really good work in that area. Um, the changes in that, the mechanism we've used is uh, through the National Endowment for Financial Education um, called Cash Course. And Cash Course, which was freely available to us through that, is now being actually shifted. NEFI, this organization, is shifting it to an, a different organization. And it is now going to be um, accessible only by being a member and paying membership fees. And, and so this is a change. And it's a good moment that we've been able to now really assess 
um, that and, and make some decisions about how we want to move forward. If it is best to stay with, with that same training, we do have a contract that permits us to use it through the end of this year, so we will still be using Cash Course in the fall. Um, but we're doing a lot of work with our, um, I'm, I'm working along with the institutions, have some great staff who are working on potentially developing their own financial literacy training in-house. We have a lot of expertise. The financial aid offices all have student loan counseling officers. They have a lot of great um, peer programs that they engage with as well. So there's a lot of good in-house expertise. Um, and so they're exploring that option of creating their own versus potentially sticking with Cash Course, which is the thing that we've used for a long time. Um, so that is in development. Um, we don't have a final answer on that yet. Um, the train, either way, the training will continue. Um, so I do want to make sure that you're best assured of that. Um, and hopefully a year from now we can update you on sort of where they land in terms of how to move forward, ensuring that this training um, continues to occur. Happy to take any questions from anybody. Any questions? So I would just like to ask, are yes. we tracking um, how student debt is, how this is impacting? Yeah, uh, yes. Um, so some of it is at a very specific level. They're able to sometimes identify us and, and talk a student out of taking out a certain loan, to, mm -hmm. to be sort of say it in a um, simple way. But in other cases, what we, what we really do watch is the average debt for our graduates. And there have been um, some really great um, efforts have led to really keeping that fairly steady over almost a decade now. Um, there was some hard work that happened over the last 10, 15 years to bring it down, and now it's really been hanging steady, even in the face of some raising tuition. Um, so there's great work happening on that front. Um, the other piece is, of course, reducing the number of students who take out loans at all. Um, we do have a, a pretty good contingent of students who graduate with zero debt, which is also awesome. a fantastic outcome. Okay, thanks, thanks. Yes, Bridget. Rachel, have you explored uh, the Iowa Student Loan? They have a lot of different programs to help educate students as well. Um, you know, I think the um, financial aid offices are all very familiar with a lot of that, and certainly students who borrow through Iowa Student Loan have really great access to a lot of that. I'm not sure how much um, sort of universal availability there is to that, if, they're, um, if that's behind a paywall, if you're not taking out a loan or not. I'd, I'd have to do some more research to figure that out, but I will ask that question. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, I just wanted Parker. to highlight that uh, the loan counseling here at UNI uh, led to uh, an average of a 21% reduction in debt. That's uh, really, uh, that's, that's, awesome. that's, that's great. <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's some unique things going on on each of the campuses as well. Indeed. So, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Rachel. Finally, I believe Provost Herrera uh, give us an update on UNI's recent reaccreditation review from the Higher Learning Commission. Thank you, Regent Baudicar and uh, members of the board. I, I appreciate uh, inaugurating my stint here with this uh, wonderful announcement that I have today. Um, on June 7th, uh, the Institution Institutional Actions Council of the Higher Learning uh, Commission reaffirmed the University of Northern Iowa's accreditation with the next reaffirmation of accreditation coming in 2031, uh, 2030, 20, uh, 2031 academic year. Uh, this uh, reaffirmation comes uh, with no follow-up reporting or targeted visit. It's a great uh, outcome. Uh, in its report, the HLC's review team uh, highlighted several key institutional strengths. Uh, these include UNI's robust systems for academic program review and assessment of student learning, our focus on student success based on regular examination of data to inform retention and completion strategies, the university's commitment to continuing engagement, and in particular the service learning uh, institutes, which facilitate service learning in the classroom by matching faculty members with community partners to develop courses that allow students to apply their learning beyond the uh, campus borders. And our comprehensive plan for improving and standardizing uh, classroom technology, which enhances student experiences uh, every day and made it possible for us to safely uh, offer 80% of our courses face-to-face -face during COVID. Uh, HLC's decision is a culmination of three-year process in which over 100 staff, faculty, and students, and I might add, and I was told board members as well, so thank you very much, uh, 
um, we conducted a comprehensive and thorough uh, self-study in every aspect of operations and had valuable discussions about things that we do well and areas we can improve. And I can already tell you that those areas are going to be the focus of what I need to do for the next year or so. I would like to thank members of the Steering Committee and the Criterion Committee uh, for their leadership and dedication to this process. I would also like to thank the Board for their continued support of you and I, especially during the on-site visit in March. The review team was grateful that so many of the Board members took time to attend and discuss the site visit. Um, I also uh, wanted to thank Dr. Patrick Peace uh, for standing in and keeping the chair not only warm, but actually uh, improving it to some degree. So thank you, Dr. Peace. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions or comments? Well, well done. Thank you very much. It's A great lot to, of work is it, right. It's great yes. to start on such great news. <laughs> yes, <laughs> great, great way to start. Welcome, yes. <laughs> thank you. Then, is there any other business to come before the committee? Seeing none, the Academic Affairs Committee is adjourned. This meeting of the Board of Regents State of Iowa for July 28th, 2021 will come to order. I'll begin by calling the roll. Regent Dunkel? Here. Regent Barker? Here. Regent Crow? Here. Regent Rouse? Here. Regent Dokovich? Here. Regent Bates? Here. Regent Lindemeyer? Here. Regent Butker? Here. Regent Richards is present. We have a quorum and we can proceed. Uh, we have no uh, speakers in the, that have signed up for the public forum. So uh, with everybody's agreement, we're going to move uh, Rachel's presentation that uh, comes from the uh, w later in the afternoon to this morning. Uh, are you prepared to do it? Okay. Go, go ahead. Uh, this is Rachel Boone from the Regents office. Thank you, President Richard, and I appreciate an opportunity to talk to you a little bit about the item that you saw in your docket on community college transfer. Um, to be honest, it's probably a little risky to ask me to talk about this because I spend so much time on it, I could go on and on and on. So I will keep us on schedule to get to lunch, I promise. Um, so there's a lot of work that happens in this area, um, both out of the board office, but really especially at the universities. There's um, a lot of connection with our community college colleagues 
all three institutions have staff that are focused entirely on this population of students from an admissions or an advising standpoint. Um, they've all got orientations for transfer students, different programming things that are done specifically for these, this set of students. Um, and there isn't a week that goes by that I'm not personally in meetings, um, in email exchanges, Zooms, everything with leadership or staff from the Community College Bureau and the Department of Education or other colleagues that work on this in the state. This is a, this is a big topic and with a lot happening. Um, and I would also frame this a little bit around the board's strategic plan and the goals that you all have in terms of access for Iowans, addressing equity and attainment gaps. Transfer students are part of that. Um, and that's an important thing. It is not just an option that's available to students who want to choose that, that pathway, but cultiva cultivating these opportunities really is an improvement to our universities. It enriches our student bodies. Um, it's serving a broad and diverse range of students, um, and it's really just good for, good for the state of Iowa. So I want to talk a little bit about the history today. I want to talk about some of the transfer pathways um, that students take, some of their outcomes, and, and other efforts that are going on in the horizon. So uh, the history, I'm going to nudge Regent Lindemeyer here to fill in gaps if I miss anything. His experience certainly um, gives him a lot of, of knowledge in this area as well. Um, but back in 1965 is actually when community colleges were sort of created in Iowa law um, and, and really developed as comprehensive community colleges in the state. And as they formed and developed, the partnership with the universities started very early. And as you can see, 1972, we started working on articulation agreements and, and had our first one in place in 73. So we've been doing this for 50 years, working with them in this way. Um, and because I'm going to use that phrase, articulation agreement, a lot, I thought I'd make sure everybody understands what that is. It really is an agreement and a guarantee to a student to say, if you do this, take these things, here's exactly what that's going to translate into when you come over to the university. Um, so these arti articulation agreements, while they sort of may seem like a piece of paper with information, it's really powerful piece of paper and information, um, and, and it gives them a, a somewhat of a, a roadmap and a guarantee. Um, there are multiple pathways, however, through a, uni through a community college, and so that's why we do have multiple articulation agreements, different types of degrees, different types of programs, and we want to be able to have a pathway that's well-defined for, for all of those for students, um, whichever one of those they choose. Um, and it's important to note, and as it says here, annual meetings to review and reaffirm, these agreements are looked at annually, and really more often than that. Um, and changes are made. Uh, curriculum changes to be responsive to the needs as, as all of these programs evolve, both at the community colleges and at the universities. We do have to update these. So there is a set in stone annual meeting where that happens every year with leaders from both sides coming together and talking through what changes are needed or if none are needed. Um, so that's an important thing that, that is an ongoing piece. Um, in addition to the articulation agreements um, and all these meetings, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, a unified website was developed. So again, we collaborate with the community colleges, the universities, all are tied in through this website. And so it's one place that students can go to and it serves as sort of a portal to the, to the details they need. They can see which course is going to translate to which other course at any of the three universities. They can look at the pathways that are out there. A lot of good and relevant information to help students and academic advisors can use this as a way to find that information as needed. Um, in addition, we, we work, again, jointly with our colleagues um, to submit a report to the General Assembly, Assembly every year. So we are annually reporting to the General Assembly in Iowa, um, summarizing this work. We're gathering faculty together across different disciplines. Um, we've done computer science, biology, philosophy, we, uh, engineering. We bring the faculty from the community colleges together with the faculty from the universities to talk about these courses, to find new ways to articulate their courses with each other. And different disciplines, not every discipline meets every year, but there are discipline meetings like this of faculty every single year to improve this and find ways to enhance this um, effort. So you've heard me use this word pathways multiple times already. Um, and not only do the community colleges have multiple degree types, you get Associate of Arts, Associate of Science, Applied, Art, applied Science, um, but students often create their own pathway um, as they sort of work their way through finding, finding out what they want to do. Um, 
And frankly, I did this myself more than 25 years ago, taking nine credits at a community college as a high school student, and then going to a private college, and then doing summer classes at a different private college. And by the time I got my bachelor's degree, I had credits from four different institutions. Um, the number of options that students have to do this has multiplied over the last 25 or 30 years. So there are a lot of unique pathways going on here. Um, and in fact, there was even a recent study that um, in a different state, looking at community college transfer students, they, they looked at 3,000 students who really did a very traditional pathway, two years at the community college, transfer immediately to the four-year institution. So 3,000 3, pretty traditional transfer students. Um, among them, they found 2,000 different pathways that they took in building that bachelor's degree. Um, so even when you narrow it to, the, to what you might think is traditional, it's, it's a varied experience. So students are unique, transfer students maybe more so. Um, and the report in the docket shared a lot of data um, on transfer students, the, and I'm gonna show you more. Um, the risk is that it seems like we reduce students to a single category or a couple of categories. They really, I just can't emphasize enough that there's a lot um, that's different about each individual. And so one of the things I most respect about when I speak with our admissions staff, um, the transfer admissions staff, how good they are at sitting down with each student one by one and finding them the pathway that is the best for them. So we have these policies at a macro level that help guide us, but really this critical work that our folks are so good at is in those one-on-one -on -one conversations, and that's really important. Um, so to the data, because you know I love that too. Um, I want to start by giving you a sense of how many students we're talking about. So in a given year, this is a 2019-20, which is a reasonably typical year um, in terms of the number of transfer students. In that year, um, 1,000 students came in with that sort of traditional Associate of Arts degree. And these two other degree types, um, uh, Associate of Applied Science, Associate of Science, another 300 or so. So we had 13 students that transferred in that year uh, from the Iowa Community Colleges that had uh, as an associate degree completed. But you see to the right there, there's two additional bars, the blue and the gold, um, totals about 1,000 students that came without a degree. Some of them had 60, 70 more credits, but yet not having had a degree conferred. Um, so that really does make up about 40% of those transfer students. So they do come having completed degrees. They also come without them. The articulation agreements I mentioned, the statewide degree level ones, um, apply just to the, the ones who complete that associate degree. These other thousand students really are the, um, often the most unique of the cases um, and, and require a lot of effort. Course level articulations, if you took comp one here, what is it, count, those all count. All of those apply to those students. Um, but I just wanted to have you a sense of scale on how, how often it is completing a degree versus not completing a degree. Um, it, it's, it does make a distinction in how we uh, work with those students. And I also want to take a, a, just a brief moment to talk about transfer in a slightly different way because we have a lot of direct from high school students that are also transferring community college credits to us. Um, and you can see here there's about a 12 year run there and it is increasing annually. And that line is pretty parallel to just the overall increase in concurrent enrollment uh, at community colleges in Iowa with these high school students. Um, to the point here, you see 18.5. I mean, that's, that's really more than a semester's worth of credit, and that's the average. Um, we have about 70% of our incoming direct from high school students bringing in community college credits now when they, when they start with us. Um, in, at, in any given fall. Um, and I'll add, there's a small portion of these, although increasing every single year as well, who actually come having completed an associate degree already as well. And they're doing that at the, they're graduating from high school and complete, completing the associate degree simultaneously. Um, so all of the articulation agreements I've mentioned, whether it's at a program level or a course level, those all apply equally to this set of students as well as to those more traditional transfer students. Uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about outcomes. We are about credits and credit accumulation, but we really want degrees, right? So let's look at that a little bit. Um, here we're comparing six-year grad rates 
Uh, we can all agree that's not our gold standard, of course, six years. However, it is one that compare that is easy to work with and compare. Um, and, and here we're breaking it down by full-time and part-time students, how, how big a course load they're enrolling in. Um, and we want to compare the transfer students to our direct from high school students to students who transfer from other places, whether it be a private college, an out-of-state university, maybe they're coming from an international institution, uh, wide range, for-profit uh, for institutions, wide range in there. Um, and you can see there's almost parity across those in terms of those six-year rates. Um, the dots that you can see scattered around on each bar, that just shows us how many students we're talking about here. So again, direct from high school is the, the largest, but 5,300 transfer students are represented in that orange bar from the Iowa Community Colleges. Um, note that the part-time ratio, though, you know, there's a almost a third of the transfer students are coming in and enrolling part-time because um, that fits. It's maybe it's closer to 10 percent of our direct from high school students. And, and I want to mention that I think course load is an important issue when we start talking about time to degree. We might often hear it takes longer to graduate. Um, part of that really is driven by the course load that individuals take. Um, so the completion rates are relatively equal when taking similar course loads. Um, and I think that's important. It's just there are a lot more transfer students choosing part-time, probably because of their various unique life circumstances. Um, and and that's, there is absolutely not, nothing wrong with that. It's just an important consideration that we continue to think about that as we talk about transfer completion rates. So I want to uh, do another comparison. Um, the composition of credits here is, I think, important. We look at the data and try to understand their pathways and their outcomes by how many credits they earn on their way to getting a bachelor's degree. So I'm starting here with those who come straight out of high school. The orange, kind of at the bottom, the smaller number there, um, that's how many they transfer in. So those are the credits they came when they started. Uh, the, the blue is what they earned at our universities and then the cumulative total at the top. It's pretty consistent there that 131 over several years. If we add in now the transfer students, we see that orange goes way up, of course. Um, I would add, we could split that out between the ones, the, the 1,300 who earn the degree versus the 40%, you know, that don't. When you look at that, the, the degree earners, their number is more like 62 or 63 credits they're transferring in. The non-degree earners, it's in the low 50s. Um, but again, such consistency there in terms of the total of credits. And then other transfer, again, it's really, really consistent. Um, and I think that's an important thing for us to note as well, because one of a critique we hear is uh, an assertion, I should say, that we hear um, is that while we, while we do accept transfer students, we don't always take all of their credits or we don't apply them to their degrees. It's not. Um, it's not being taken equally. Um, and I will say, again, while students are unique, there are going to be individual cases in any number of uh, examples. Uh, systematically, the data don't suggest we have a major problem here. The data suggests that transfer students are having a roughly similar experience to a student who comes to us straight from high school. Uh, so we find that to be fairly encouraging as well. And finally, I want to put this, in the con this data into context a little bit. There are two different rankings you see here, and I'm, I'm going to explain that. Uh, transfer out, let's focus on that one first, where it says third in the nation. Um, transfer out looks at things from the perspective of the community college. So a student starts there, of the students who do that, and then transfer out to get a bachelor's degree, what's their completion rate? Um, and turns out, Iowa Community Colleges have the third uh, completion rate in the nation for that. Uh, we, we think this is a great barometer to say they're, they're doing a pretty darn good job uh, preparing students to be successful at the bachelor's degree level. So if we flip over and look at the transfer in bachelor's completion rate, this is looking at it from the university perspective. So this uh, National Student Clearinghouse analyzed all 50 states, looked at their public university systems, and said, okay, for your public system as a whole, transfer students you accept in, how good are you at getting them to their bachelor's degree? Um, and it turns out we're pretty good at that. Uh, first in the nation for getting students who transfer in from the community college to that bachelor's degree. Um, and we should be awfully proud of that, I would say. 
Um, this isn't a time when I say our work is done. Um, the bar needs to be raised nationally. The bar needs to be raised, and that means our bar needs to be raised as well. Um, but it does say that the work being, having been done over the last 50 years has been reasonably effective. We've, been, we've done some things right, um, and that's, uh, that's an exciting thing to, it's a good position to be in. Uh, yes, please. Can I ask, are they keeping track of this data on a four-year graduation rate? Um, the, the time, you know what, I, I would want to go back to the report to clarify on their time frame on that. My guess is it's a three-year actually, like, so post-transfer degree mm -hmm. within three years, I would, I think, but uh, Regent Bucker, I'd want to verify that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, finally, I'll just I'll talk just a little bit about new and ongoing efforts. Um, there is a lot um, there's a lot happening, and it does evolve. Um, so, as I've noted, there's there's ongoing communication between institutions, community college, board office, Department of Ed. There are a lot of players in this space, and, and we are working together a lot. Um, a lot of campus visits occurring with students. Um, all of these things are are critical pieces of it. We get faculty together, we get administrators together, and we bring students um, through that pipeline. Uh, but ongoing things, new and ongoing, um, as it's evolving. There, the three things up there on the le top left, transfer majors is a big initiative. The community college is launched, really, and that's about helping students who come to that community college knowing, I want to study this, I want to major in this, when I transfer, helping them get into that coursework earlier, helping them align and so that they can say, I'm a math major while I'm at Indian Hills Community College and here are the courses I take and I know what that's gonna mean for me to pursue that math major when I transfer to wherever I wanna be. Um, that is a big initiative, to be honest with you. Lots of engagement and faculty at the department level engaging in this work. Um, so a lot going on in that space. Uh, reverse cre credit transfer, those thousand students, those 40%, they're coming without a degree. What we know through a lot of research is that having that associate degree really matters. It isn't just about the bachelor's degree. Having that marker that uh, along the way does, does mean something important. And so if they transfer without it, a lot of times what we're, we're able to do is take the credits they earn at the university, send that transcript back to the community college, and help them reach a point where they can get that associate degree conferred still um, while they're even enrolled with us. Uh, that's a big effort. There's a lot that goes into that, um, and it's been successful. And the military credit articulations, that is a big partnership we have with the community colleges as well, helping our veterans, helping those who are even um, active duty find ways to get the training and education they get in the military, figuring out how that translates into university community college and university credits. Um, there are a lot of partnerships listed up there. I don't need to name them all. This is a truncated list, I will say that. There's <laughs> much more beyond that. Um, but we are engaging across the whole state in different ways with the community college um, districts. Um, and I don't want to miss the opportunity to talk about our degree completion options. We do have a Bachelor of Liberal study, Studies, Bachelor of Applied Studies, and the Bachelor of Business Administration, which is a new degree, um, that really these three are ones that our faculty have gotten together and designed to support students who either did or didn't complete that associate degree, but have significant prior earned credits and wanna get the most flexible option to get them to that bachelor's degree completion. There's a lot more distance options, a lot more flexibility intentionally built into these programs. Um, of course, a very notable alum of our BLS at Iowa State University, Governor Reynolds, but there are hundreds of Iowans pursuing those flexible degree completion options every year. Um, really important option that we've been able to make available. Uh, so, as I said, I'm, I'm happy to talk about this. I'm happy to talk about it more if you have <laughs> more questions. Um, it's great work. The people at the, I can't say enough about how highly I feel about the, the individuals our universities have doing this work. Um, just outstanding. I love collaborating with them, and I will take any questions. Are there questions or comments? Regent Parker? Just want to, I just wanted to point out that not only is Iowa first and third, but 
we're I was substantially ahead of the national averages, so it's not like all the states are about the same and Iowa yeah. happens to be a little bit ahead. It's uh, substantially above that U.S. average in other states. Yeah, no, thank you, Regent Barger. Um, digging into the data is actually really fun because you can find those little nuggets and see how that um, really over time has, has grown and developed. We, we don't have... Um, as much of that as we want. I, w I wish we had better access to that data because I think we'd find some other interesting things that might help us drive and develop um, and, and to do even better. But there's, some, there's a lot of great little nuggets in that. Regent Lundemeyer. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that regents do a great job with that now. Mm -hmm. I, I've watched it mature over the years and the community colleges, particularly the faculty uh, maturation process has helped with that too. But, but uh, the regents have made a big effort in that, and, and uh, I think it's a good, clean process. Generally speaking, there's always anecdotal things that come up with any yeah. transfer. A uh, question I have, do you, do you have any idea how many uh, transfer students are captured by the regents versus private colleges? in Iowa? Yeah, it's a great, I mean, so we do have the market share advantage. Um, I'm trying to call back in my memory to, I, I don't have that at my fingertips, but Jason does. <laughs> He's on vacation, but we will get that for you because I, it, we do have a market share um, advantage by, I think, a good measure. Yeah. Regent Crow. Thanks for presenting on this, Rachel. I was just wondering if you could tell us about any efforts or what um, could be possibilities about educating students or universities on the benefits of completing the associate's degree in terms of how much more successful students are yeah. in completing those bachelor's degrees. Oh, thank you, Regent Crow. So um, we do talk about that a lot, and we talk about it with our community college colleagues a lot because um, it's an interesting thing where, you know, one might assume the universities want to get the students as quickly as possible, right? Um, but we see the advantage that, that having completed that associate degree before they come um, really does help those transfer students be more successful. And so we work a lot um, in that our, our transfer admissions folks and, and, and the individuals who work with the students when they do want to transfer are deeply engaged with the transfer advisors at the community colleges. They have an open, they have a listserv and they, they are emailing each other updates all the time and sharing information. So there are a lot of, a lot of that becomes informal um, in terms of how we counsel individual students. There are rare programs where maybe it would benefit the student to come a little earlier just to keep them on pace. Um, to stay ahead of prerequisites, that sort of thing. But that's, those are rare programs. Quite often, our advice to the community college students is, hey, don't, if, you've, if you've got 45 credits, hang in there, finish that degree, and then we've got you. These articulation agreements are your best guarantee for your transfer credits. You're gonna, you're gonna be better off if you finish that associate degree first. That's a, that's a consistent message. Regent Bates. <laughs> so when you see high school students coming in directly with several credits, do you see that increasing in time with more and more credits? Um, so crystal ball, yeah, I think, I don't know, I don't know where the ceiling is on it, right? right? Um, I do, you know, it's, it's been consistent, so I don't think we've reached the ceiling yet. Um, 18 and a half is a lot. It, yes, it's um, a lot. And so I don't, I don't know. It's a great question. I don't. So where does the articulation come with them when mm -hmm. they come directly in? Is that? Yeah. So a lot of that. So the articulations. There's two two varieties of those. One is these statewide uh, articulations that cover when you finish the associate degree. Here's what that means. Mm -hmm. There are, and once we create these, they get baked into the system, um, course by course articulations as well. So that. Um, if there's a psych one being taught in concurrent enrollment by DMAC at Boone High School, Iowa State knows exactly what that psych one will translate into at Iowa State University, and that's, that's set. That's a course level articulation. That's what the high school students get the greatest benefit of, is having those course level articulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sherry, yeah. with regard to the... Uh, uh, those high school enrollments, what they've done, you know, when I was still in that business, 
uh, there were a couple community colleges that about tw uh, 15 to 20 percent of their enrollment were high school enrollments, and that was that was a lot we thought. And uh, but now most of those community college enrollments, it's about 40 percent of their enrollment are high school enrollments. So now their enrollments have their total number has gone down, so that naturally increases the percentage, but. There are so many more students taking those high school credits now, and it saves families a lot of money. Oh, it does. And uh, yeah. I just saw a recent uh, publication of a community college that's trying to pass a bond issue, and they're, they were advertising the uh, X million, million dollars saved to families mm -hmm. uh, with high school credits. So it's a significant market. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Other questions for Regent Ross? So for those high school students, is it a combination of a teacher being in their high school that kind of can do dual as well as potentially going to the community college? I mean, it's kind of a both. It is both. Um, it is mostly the first thing you said, the teacher in the school. Um, but absolutely, some of it is going to the college, the community college campus. And by the way, we have high school students who come on our three campuses as well. The numbers are just much, 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 much smaller. Like a fraction. <laughs> so thinking about rural areas, is it harder for rural school districts potentially to get teachers that would be able to teach concurrent enrollment? Or is that? Yeah, yeah no, there are constraints, absolutely, because there is a, quali a sort of a standard qualification um, that is needed for the teacher to be able to do that. Um, and actually, this is another area where Regent Linda Meyer can probably speak um, with more confidence than I can. Um, it is a problem. The good thing about the way Iowa community colleges are organized is they are they have districts, and so every single school district is part of one of the community college districts. They know who to work with. They know every school district knows which community college they're aligned with. Um, the ways in which they can find teachers who are qualified to do that is is hard. I believe it's a challenge at the community college. Yeah, I think I think your question is well placed, particularly in rural areas. As schools have shrunk, it's it's uh, harder for those small rural schools to find maybe a math teacher or a Spanish teacher. So now they call on the community college, and and since those enrollments have shrunk, sometimes those loads are lighter at the community college too. So they're they're lending staff uh, or hiring out staff, contracting staff out. So it helps in the rural areas. And online, I should yeah, emphasize, online. they're using online modality to help with some of that as well. Any other uh, questions for Rachel? We, we all know Rachel is a great resource for the regions, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have a break now for lunch. Or, we're going to be back. Uh, we're going to get back on time. We'll be back at 12:30 uh, for so we have 23 minutes. <laughs> Thank you.
uh, the Board of Regents uh, meeting is resuming. Uh, we'll start with the consent agenda. We'll go back to the same sequence uh, that, that's otherwise in the board. Are there items the board members would like to remove from the consent agenda for a separate vote? A motion and a second are required to approve and receive the items on the consent agenda. Is there a motion? Regent second. Dunkel, a second by Regent Dokovic. Any discussion? We'll have a roll call vote. Uh, Regent Bates? Yes. Regent Dunkel? Yes. Regent Lindemeyer? Yes. Regent Barker? Yes. Regent Rouse? Yes. Regent Dokovic? Yes. Regent Crow? Yes. Regent Butker? Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion is approved. I have a few very brief comments uh, to make today. First of all, we'd like to welcome uh, the new president of the University of Iowa, Barbara Wilson, to our meeting. Uh, during the search process, President Wilson showed the board that she has the vision, skills, and decision-making ability to lead the University of Iowa. She is the right leader for the university, and we are optimistic about her leadership going forward. Uh, President Wilson, you will have the full support of this board and will be joining two other excellent presidents of our universities, Regent Universities, President Winterstein and President Nook. So welcome aboard. Second, as we approach the fall semester, I want to continue to call for all of our faculty and students to get their COVID vaccinations. The data is clear. If you're vaccinated, your chances of in infection, uh, uh, receive, getting an infection decrease and your chances of severe illness or death drop significantly. This applies to the Delta variant as well. Almost all hospitalizations for COVID are among the unvaccinated. As a retired medical doctor, I strongly encourage that everyone be vaccinated and will continue to do so. It's really quite simple, get vaccinated. Finally, the board spends a great deal of time and thought setting tuition rates. Regent Barker wrote a recent op-ed in the Des Moines Register earlier this month on the cost of higher education in Iowa. He had many good points, and if you missed it, I encourage you to look for it and read it. Our Regent Universities have found many ways to be more efficient and have exceptionally low administrative costs compared to their peers. Nevertheless, even with cost cutting and flat appropriations, for the last two years, our costs continue to rise. We still need financial resources to provide a quality education for our students. We always try to find the right balance to provide those resources while keeping the cost to the students and their families as affordable as possible. Our goal is to provide quality, affordable, and accessible education. Thank you. Now I'd like to re recognize uh, Brad Berg from the uh, Regent's office. And he's going to take over the rest of the meeting. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you, President Richards. Uh, before, you, before the board today is the second and final reading of the proposed tuition mandatory fees and common and university specific fees for the 2021-22 academic year. All rates before you today remain identical to those of the first reading. Uh, the base undergraduate resident tuition rates include a $283 increase to a new tuition rate of $8,356 at the University of Iowa, a $282 increase to $8,324 at Iowa State, and an increase of $115 to $7,780 at the University of Northern Iowa. The docket also includes varying uh, increases to other student categories, differential tuition for higher cost programs, and, and mandatory fees as provided in the docket. Uh, the board's also asked to approve the allocation of the student activities and service fees and the building fees as recommended by the student fee committees as required by statute. With that, I would be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Does anybody have a question? I mean, we have, we've had a lot of discussion about it, I know. So, Any comments? Thank you. A motion and a second are required to approve the following. The proposed tuition and mandatory fees for the 2021-2022 academic year are, as outlined in the agenda item, effective with the fall semester 2021 semester. Effective with the fall 2021 semester. The allocation of the region University's mandatory student fees for the 2021-22 academic year is outlined in the agenda item. And the proposed common and university and program specific fees for the 2021-22 academic year is outlined in the agenda item. Is there a motion? I move. Regent Butker? Yes. Regent Dakovich seconds? There's a motion by Regent Butker and a second by Regent Dokovich. Any discussion? We'll have a roll call vote. Uh, Regent Barker? Yes. Regent Bates? Yes. Regent Butker? Yes. Regent Crow? Yes. Regent Dokovich? Yes. Regent Dunkel? Yes. Regent Rouse? Yes. Regent Lindermeyer? Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion carries. And now I'd like to recognize okay. Brad Berg again. Uh, also before you today are the FY22 University and Special School Operating and Restricted Fund Budgets. Uh, the docket also contains separate budgets for the resident systems, athletics, Iowa Public Radio, uh, as well as the board office. Uh, the university presidents have prepared comments related to their budgets as part of their leadership updates and, and for the sake of the listeners and presenters we'll start with President Wilson followed by President Winterstein uh, and conclude with President Nook. So unless there are questions for me on the budgets we can begin with President Wilson. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Thanks so much, President Richards and President Pro Tem Bates and members of the board. This is a, a really nice opportunity for us to, to review the budget for FY22 and to talk to you about our priorities, which are all really geared toward academic excellence at the University of Iowa. First, I'd like to say a few words, just a few, about my two weeks uh, at the university, so I'm on board now. I moved in and I've been spending uh, countless hours going out and visiting with people. You may have seen some video coverage of the activities. It's been wonderful. I've had lots of opportunities to meet with uh, faculty. Not so many students are around right now, but they'll come back soon and with staff 
uh, both on the east and the west side of the university, and with people in the community as well. So it's been great. I'm not tired yet. I am trying to pace myself, um, but it's been delightful. And I have to say that I knew that the University of Iowa was a special place before I arrived, but everything that's, that I've learned since then has only confirmed that. This is an amazing university, and I've um, spent time learning about the exceptional programs in writing and communication across the curriculum, uh, the healthcare activities uh, and enterprise, and even our work in fighting COVID. It's all been exceptional and confirmed to me that, that the University of Iowa is truly one of the finest universities in the country. I'm, of course, also delighted to be part of the partnership with the other two Regent Universities as well. So um, everything, of course, comes back to academic excellence, and we want to tie all of what we do, including the budget, to academic excellence. And so, hmm, that's not good. What button am I pushing to advance the slide? Maybe I don't have the magic touch. Up oh, there it is. Okay, good. So everything comes back to academic excellence and academic quality, and it is the center of all that we do at the University of Iowa, from the students to the patients to the faculty and to people in our communities and really across the state. Our goal is to be excellent, to serve all of our state stakeholders, and to ensure that our actions are aligned with the budget. Just like families in the, in the state of Iowa, our university has to set a budget for the coming year, and we've done a lot of work on that. You can see what we are projecting as an increase, a modest increase in our budget. And uh, it, we have to acknowledge that our budget will be challenged by the impact of COVID over the next year, but not just the next year. It will be a recurring set of costs that we'll be dealing with into the future. Uh, you can see from this slide that we are expecting a, approximately a 1.4% increase in our budget over FY21. And we have to acknowledge that even with the tuition increase that you've all just approved, and we're very grateful for that, we're still going to be challenged to cover inflationary costs across all we do. Uh, our goal, of course, is to always ask every unit on our campus, what can you do, what levers can you pull and push to increase uh, efficiency, and also how can we grow the pie? So that's the kind of thing we're going to be working on in the coming years, but particularly in the next year. The next slide shows that we have been the recipient of a good amount of federal government support, and we're very grateful for that. We've spent those resources where they need to be spent, and, and we've outlined it here, the HERF 1, 2, and 3. And uh, all of these costs, uh, all of these funds are one-time funds, so they're not recurring. They're really just going to help us cover the unusual and um, devastating, in some cases, impacts of COVID. So we'll be very deliberate about those, and you can see the different categories uh, that we're going to be using these one-time resources. The next slide uh, really illustrates the features of our budget that I'm particularly proud of and that I know you know about. 70% uh, of the general education fund is supported by tuition at the University of Iowa, and so it really is our commitment to be as efficient and effective as we can with the dollars that our students and their families are providing to us to ensure their, their academic excellence. And I'm proud really to say that according to the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, our university spends 11 cents on administrative costs for every dollar spent on education, 11 cents. Uh, and to give you some context in that same study, Iowa, the University of Iowa spends 32% less on administrative costs compared to our peers. So we'll just be continuing to talk about that and remind our stakeholders and our legislative community that we are as efficient as we can be and more efficient than many peers across the country. And we'll continue to look for those kinds of efficiencies as we go forward. And of course, we have our P3 partnership that we're very grateful that you approved, and that will allow us also to continue moving forward across a number of our strategic priorities re related to excellence. So, speaking about investments, 
We are be, uh, using, in particular, the P3 funds, one-time resources to support students. And you may recall that students were at the core of almost everything I spoke about during the interview process. I will continue to be uh, a big advocate for ensuring that students are first in almost everything that we do at the University of Iowa. Uh, some of what we're going to be doing is launching some new programs, and we've got three of them that you can see up here. We're using one-time resources to enhance our support for students to make sure that we're using state-of-the-art empirical research to study what is impactful for students, what's going to ensure their success, and that we're finding all different places where there may be roadblocks or things that are hindering their success so that we can begin to close the gaps. And we'll be very data-driven as we do this. And the P3 funding will allow us to pilot some of these new ideas before we launch them uh, more expansively across all of our student body. The next slide uh, further illustrates that, of course, one of our most important goals is to increase retention and graduation. And I've been talking a lot about this. Those rates need to come up. And it's not going to be just one office's responsibility. It's not just the provost. It's a variety of different offices across the, across the university. And here it illustrates, I think, the fact that we need to pay attention to a lot of different uh, parts of a student's experience holistically. Uh, I would like to say that we're, we're not just thinking about a student's academic success. We're thinking about their career aspirations. We're thinking about their financial support. And we're thinking about health and wellness. And a student can't survive and thrive unless we put all those pieces together and think holistically about what will support our students. Particularly, I want to say, during the pandemic, we know that mental health, for example, is going to be all the more critical that we pay attention to students' well-being, that we ensure that we're going to take uh, special care to make sure they can come back to our universities and feel comfortable and confident and connected with other people. And that will be part of what we are doing uh, on the mental and, and, and physical well-being side. But that will connect to academic success. So uh, again, a very holistic approach. Our Division of Student Life has been working very hard on mental health, and we're getting ready to announce some new uh, activities that we will be doing that will connect our students even more urgently to resources to help them as they come back for the fall. The next slide is hard to read, and you don't need to spend too much time on all the particulars, although if you have any questions about any of these programs, we're happy to provide data and information on them. I think the slide just is really in, intended to illustrate that we're busy. We have a lot of um, different activities that we're testing and that we're piloting. And they follow the student through all phases of how a st new student comes to our university, from onboarding through finding their home, finding a major, thinking about a career, and, uh, and then beyond the university. So, uh, and these are just a, a, a handful of the things that we're, that we're involved in and that we're looking at. And I think the important thing is the diagram suggests that these are siloed, but the arrows are meant, and really if we were doing it right, we'd have arrows going all over the place. But we're really trying to be a coordinated set of services and support activities. And our goal, and we will be working to do even better on this, is to make sure that we're connecting the dots across our colleges, across our divisions, and across our different support units. Uh, so that we're not duplicating our efforts, we're not um, getting in the way of each other, and that we're actually working together across different units. And we'll be constantly using, uh, as only universities are prone to do, using a lot of data and a lot of uh, empirical evidence to figure out what works, what doesn't work, and how to bolster those things that we know are successful. In addition to focusing on students, of course, we're going to be focusing on faculty. Uh, in, in my mind, great faculty are the heart of a university. Students come to work with faculty. We have to make sure that we not only attract great faculty, but that we keep the ones that we've spent so much money and time to recruit 
to Iowa. And so some of the P3 money will be used to do some selective and important hiring in certain areas of excellence that we know are critical as we go forward. I have just listed a few examples here, but of course there are many, many more. We're going to be looking at how do we build space physics and space science? How do we uh, work more on neuroscience? We had a great presentation at the last board meeting that gave you a sense of the exciting work that's being done, interdisciplinary work uh, around brain and neuroscience and health. And we've got a lot more research in the healthcare area and also research and scholarship and creative activities across writing and across communication on our campus. So many of the funds will be used to keep our great faculty and recruit some new ones and ensure that all of those faculty are dedicated to student support dedicated to student education, and of course to involving our students in the research and scholarship that we do. I'm particularly pleased that I'm coming in at a point where I can still have a great impact on our new strategic plan. We've got a lot of activities going on, le learning and listening sessions across the university through the summer and into September, and then we'll continue to work on gathering all the feedback that we're, uh, w that we're hearing and listening and learning about with regard to the strategic plan. Uh, we, we've got a lot of work to do. Our goal is to make this strategic plan a living document, not something that gathers dust on the, uh, in the shelf in a closet, but something that we can pick up regularly and say, how are we doing? Are we meeting our goals? Are we working toward the kinds of things that we all care about? And this timeline, I think, illustrates to you how much engagement we've got and how many planned ways we have for stakeholders to have a voice in this, in this strategic thinking. We'll be bringing this plan to you next year in 2022, and uh, I'm hoping that it will excite you as much as it will excite all of our local stakeholders. One thing I can commit to you is that the, that the strategic plan will clearly have metrics related to retention and graduation rates for students. That will be one of my key foci, set of foci, and we'll also be looking very carefully at our research a portfolio and how do we grow that as well in terms of our strategic planning. So as we look forward to the coming year, our goal is, as I said, increase retention rates, increase graduation rates, increase our research and scholarship, and begin to decrease gaps any place we see them, uh, particularly for students first in family to go to college, students from underrepresented groups, uh, and students who are coming to us with backgrounds that need special support. Uh, I'm very excited about the strategic plan. So I'm, I'm going to wrap it up by saying the budget can't be talked about without talking about academic excellence and without talking about our goals. And I'm sensing on, uh, across my first meetings a real excitement about the future, uh, a, a desire to work together, and uh, a desire for strong leadership. And we'll be bringing our teams together, our deans, folks in the provost's office, and of course in my office, to work together to make this happen. So I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Regent Barker. Um, well, the numbers you mentioned on uh, administrative costs are very impressive. Um, and I know you've only been at Iowa a short time, but uh, is it your sense that the efficiency measures that have been taken are appropriate um, in a cost-benefit sense? In other words, does the university run well even with this low level of uh, administrative cost? Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, question, Regent Barker. I would say it's a little early for me to be too, um, too definitive about that, but what I can say based on my comparisons to other institutions uh, is that we are running a very efficient and pretty lean operation. The one area I worry a little bit about is our support for research. And I'm hearing this from some of our top researchers who are saying things like, uh, we want to be getting more grants, we need to be writing more proposals, we need to make sure we have the support to run the operations and the research, and we may have gone a little lean on that side. So that'll be something that we look in at very carefully because, of course, we all know we can't attract and retain those great faculty without funding dollars, and many of those uh, big grants require a lot of team science to make them work, including the technical support around that activity. That's sort of the back office kind of support. 
the research technicians, the data analysts, the people on the financial side. And if a faculty member is worried about that, he or she is not going to be nearly as uh, successful on the research front. So that's my initial impression, but I'm happy to come back and talk more about that after I've done some more visits. So. Any other questions? Thank you, uh, President Wilson. Thank you. President Winterstein. Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see you. Always appreciate the opportunity to come and visit about Iowa State University and give you an update on where we are. Uh, beautiful photo, right? Uh, right by the Memorial Union. Uh, what a great uh, summer we've had getting ready for what we expect to be a fabulous fall. Well, uh, we continue uh, to be a national leader in operational efficiency. Uh, we took a number of proactive steps uh, to develop a strong budget uh, for this year, and you can see those up there. Uh, we are very lean, uh, and this is shown by our ongoing trend of having fewer employees per student. Ten years ago, Iowa State employees per student was .192 when our enrollment was 28,682. Last year, our enrollment was 31,825, and we had 0.189 employees per student. Again, showing our great uh, efficiency at Iowa State. One of our major cost-saving measures this past year was the implementation of our Retirement Incentive Option Program. 318 employees were approved for what we called our RIO. And it's expected to save $42 million over the next three years, uh, including $10.3 million uh, for, this, for this year. We also reduced uh, by 2% the university's match uh, for our TIAA VALIC uh, retirement plans for 10 months as a precautionary measure and a measure really to help us get through the past year's financial difficulties. And it saved us six. $1 million. So again, taking some proactive steps uh, to maintain a strong uh, budget position at Iowa State. Well, keeping tuition rates is uh, keeping tuition rates low is important uh, at Iowa State. Our land grant mission was founded on providing affordable, high quality education to students from diverse backgrounds, and we continue to deliver on that commitment. When we look at other public state universities in the Midwest, Iowa State compares very favorably. We offer the next to lowest tuition and fees for in-state students. And as we know, tuition and fees and state appropriations are the two main sources of revenue for public universities. So it would stand to reason that if we have a very low tuition, then perhaps we would have one of the highest state appropriations. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, the third column on this slide shows the fiscal year 19 state appropriations per student FTE. The most recent data available for, through iPads uh, for each university. And you can see that Iowa State University has one of the lowest state appropriations per student in the Midwest region. Minnesota, which tops the list uh, for the highest state appropriation per students, also has the next to highest tuition and fee rate for residents undergraduates. Next on the list is Nebraska. Their tuition and fee rate is not far off from Iowa State's, but in fiscal year 19, they receive $4,300 more per student in state appropriations. Further down the list, you see Missouri, which charges $4,500 more in tuition and fees for its resident students than Iowa State while receiving comparable state funding. Consequently, as state funding for Iowa State has stagnated and even declined, tuition increases have become unavoidable. We appreciate the Board of Regents' five-year tuition plan, which provides transparency and predictability. Even with the increase for the coming year, Iowa State's tuition and fees will still be the next to lowest in the Midwest. 
New revenue is essential for Iowa State to continue to provide high quality education delivered by a world class faculty and ensuring that Iowa State students are career ready. It's also vital for us to be able to have the services and support that our students are requesting and that they need and that need to be provided by very caring staff that we have at the university. Well, a lack of funding has greatly increased our financial challenges. Uh, without competitive salaries and salary increases, Iowa State will see increased difficulty in retaining excellent faculty and talented staff members. Increasing inflation for supplies and services is also a serious concern. And Iowa State is it really in dire need of technology updates to improve operations and the student experience, which costs tens of millions of dollars to implement. The competition for non-resident students has dramatically increased as nearby states are investing heavily in their university scholarships for students. And finally, the backlog of deferred maintenance, residual COVID-19 costs, and other miscellaneous items further weaken our financial condition. Increasing state funding is imperative for Iowa State University to accelerate its role as an economic engine for Iowa. Iowa State is meeting its part of the bargain to make Iowa future ready in a number of ways. First, we are preparing Iowa's future STEM workforce. Iowa is widely known for a, as being a leader in STEM education. Indeed, students enrolled in these five programs that are shown on the slide uh, account for nearly 20% of our total student population. More than half of all of our students are enrolled in a STEM field. Listed here are some of the companies that hire many Iowa State graduates. And pictured is Abby Grease. She graduated from Iowa State a year ago with a degree in aerospace engineering. She now works as an associate systems engineer for Collins Aerospace. Overall, our students are graduating faster than ever before. The average time it takes to get an ISU degree is 4.4 years. Historically, within six months of getting a degree, 95% of our graduates get a job in their field or pursue higher education. And many of our graduates stay in Iowa to begin their careers, although we'd like to see the number grow. 58% of resident students stay in Iowa, 18% of non-resident, and 27% of international students. Another way we're helping make Iowa future ready is through the synergy of our research and innovation and the opportunities that abound at the Iowa State University Research Park. We're helping build businesses in our backyard and we see a number of these startups move or expand throughout Iowa. Startups that have relocated from the ISU Research Park employ more than 2,500 Iowans across the state while companies currently located at the park employ another 2,000 people. Really, a number of great successes. The park has added 12 new tenants since March, and I will just tell you the other day in visiting with Rick Sanders, who leads the ISU Research Park, he told me the park is essentially full and out of space. And you can see that we have a whole set of companies that are there in this space, and just a couple of the Tenants that I'll name for you, Merck, Vermeer, John Deere, Kent Corporation, Collins Airspace, Aerospace, to name a few. Well, as we think about uh, the top Iowa's economic sectors, uh, Iowa State is really having a major uh, impact. Uh, first, ISU research and expertise in the biosciences is helping to fuel the state's bioeconomy. And we are grateful for the $1.8 million increase in state funding support this year. And the funding will be leveraged to advance all three platforms, bio-based projects, uh, digital agriculture, and nano vaccines. And we'll continue to focus uh, on identifying and accelerating development of commercial opportunities, attracting external funding, and providing that innovation ecosystem services accelerating technology transfer, 
and developing a highly skilled workforce. This will help us build on our accomplishments of the past year uh, as we are able to put into place our chief technology officers for all three of these biosciences platforms at Iowa State. Our Office of uh, the Vice President for Research initiated seed funding grants to support public-private research projects across all three platforms, again with a set of important companies in Iowa, Kimmon Industries, Kent Corporation, ADM, Iowa Select Farms, and Corteva AgriSciences. And nearly 20 uh, faculty-initiated uh, startup companies have licensed Iowa State discovered technologies, in, including Scrote Laboratory, 3D Health Solutions, just to name a few. Well, Iowa State also directly benefits Iowans uh, through the $32.5 billion animal agricultural industry and the services provided by our world-class veterinary diagnostic laboratory, and we're seeing a record demand for these services. The VDL's caseload is the largest of any VDL in the United States, and it's more than doubled in the past seven years and reached an all-time high of 100,000 cases last year. We appreciate that the state funding for the veterinary diagnostic lab uh, was increased uh, or restored to its 20 fiscal year 20 level. The funding is essential uh, to be able to operate the lab at the proper level and to maintain preparedness. Livestock and poultry producers continue to use VDL extensively to prevent the introduction of costly diseases. I want to share with you one example of a major new research project that exemplifies our brand Innovate at Iowa State. This is truly innovation with impact. Iowa State was recently selected for a $16 million grant to develop wireless technologies that will make rural broadband more affordable and accessible. As we saw over the past year, fast, reliable internet access is no longer a luxury. It truly is a necessity. Governor Reynolds has also made rural broadband uh, expansion a top priority for the state. Iowa State University is leading this initiative, which will have a direct impact on rural Iowans, making it possible to connect and create opportunities for families, schools, farms, and communities across the state. Hong Wei Zhang, pictured here, is a professor of electrical and computer engineering, and he's leading Iowa State's team in the collaboration with a number of local and state partners. The project is funded by the National Science Foundation, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and with industry partners as well. Uh, despite the challenges of the past year, Iowa State attracted a record amount of external funding, uh, more than $559 million. Uh, included in this total is the phenomenal work of our researchers to secure more than $231 million in sponsored research funding. Uh, our faculty researchers are indeed entrepreneurs. Uh, the state funding that we receive to support faculty positions is leveraged many times over as faculty go over to seek external funding to support their work. So we're very pleased and uh, happy with their success. Pictured here is uh, Riza Barden, Associate Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering. She's part of ISU's nationally recognized Nano Vaccine Institute, focused on using technology to enhance individualized treatment for colorectal cancer. The quote you see here is from the new vice president for research, Peter Dorhout. He's been on the job just for seven months, uh, starting back in January at the height of the pandemic. Imagine moving in the middle of the pandemic to a new university. And he hit the ground running to support our faculty and staff as we grow research through innovation. Well, here's what we hope campus will look like on August 23rd. Uh, and what I want to underscore for my presentation today is truly Iowa State's commitment to our students and the extraordinary experience that they have when they come to Iowa State, the success in the classroom, in the activities outside of the classroom, in our new Student Innovation Center. 
certainly the success of our faculty in innovation and research as well, our commitment to support the state as a whole all across our 99 counties. Uh, we really do believe that Iowa State University provides a great return on investment, that we are making Iowa future ready, and thank you for the opportunity to share the good news and uh, about Iowa State as well as our budget planning for the coming year. Any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Are there any questions, Regent Barker? Um, you mentioned a dire need for technology upgrades. Um, I know you've had some major upgrades over the last couple of years, for example, Workday. I just wanted to confirm that you're happy with those and that they're worth the cost and that they contribute to the administrative efficiencies that you mentioned. Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> so just, just joking with you, but seriously, the, without Workday, we would not have been able to get through COVID as well as we did. Uh, Workday phase one was really about finance and human resources. And when I talk about the tens of millions more that we're going to invest, it's really about how we look at Workday student and ISU receivables, another set of areas that simply uh, have to be done. We have to continue to move forward. It's required for the successful operation of the university. So these are investments that will have financial returns as right. well. Yeah. We'll have great returns. Yep. Great. Thank you. Richard Butker. Thank you. Um, th I'm just curious about this. It's not a, a big question, but I wanted to ask if you're going to have a presence at the Iowa State Fair, all of the universities, and, and how, how is that, what that's going to look like? This year? Well, we're very excited to be uh, at the State Fair every year, of course, and we're glad that the varied industries building is air conditioned. So. <laughs> Uh, but we will be there with a, a program from the Student Innovation Center, and this year we will be doing a set of competitions related to the use of Legos. And Regent Bucker, I cannot exactly explain what that means, but I do know that as part of our display, there will be a sculpture of George Washington Carver made out of Legos. Uh, I hope I'm not part of building it, but uh, we are gonna have a good time at the State Fair. Again, back to innovation, back to a competitive environment, uh, helping students understand uh, that they too can learn what it means to compete and to win. Thank you. Thank you. President Nook, thank you for hosting today, by the way. Thank you, you're most welcome. Uh, Regent President Richards, members of the board, and colleagues from across uh, the state of Iowa region institutions, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the University of Northern Iowa. It's always a pleasure to have you on our campus, give you the opportunity to see what happens here a little bit. It's summer, so it's pretty quiet, and unfortunately, it's a little warmer than we'd like, too, but uh, thanks for joining us here at the University of Northern Iowa. I want to offer a special welcome to uh, Regents Rouse and, and Crow. Uh, it's great to have you on campus yesterday. And, getting the orientation done and a, a special outreach also and welcome to uh, President Wilson. It's great to have you on board as well. So welcome to the system. It's not good, oh there, I was gonna say it's not good when I can't run the technology, but. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to welcome uh, two of our new vice presidents to campus and uh, formally introduce those them to the board. Uh, you met Dr. Jose Herrera, our provost, this morning during the academic affairs um, meeting. Uh, he is a higher education leader with more than 30 years of experience, most recently joining us uh, from Mercy College, uh, where he was the provost and academic vice president. Uh, he also has time in, in academic leadership roles at uh, Western New Mexico University, started his career at, at uh, Truman State as a faculty member in the biology department. He has his PhD from uh, Kansas State University and his undergraduate degrees from Northern Illinois University, the other institution that is NIU, but we're UNI and a much better institution. Um, I'd like to also introduce uh, Dr. David Grady, who many in this room already know. Uh, Dr. Grady is joining us as the Interim Vice President for Student Affairs. He has served as Vice President of Student Affairs at the University of Alabama, 
He's also been a senior fellow at the National Association for Student Personnel Administrators in Washington, D.C. He had uh, more than six years here in, at the University of Iowa as an associate vice president and uh, dean of students. Uh, he has his master's degree from Harvard in education and a PhD um, in higher education administration uh, from the University of Texas at Austin. Welcome to both Dr. Herrera and uh, Dr. Grady. It's both great to have both of you on board. They both just started this month, so we're breaking them in quickly. <laughs> but thank you for joining us. With that, let me turn to the budget. To begin with, um, just provide a little background on how we um, go about putting budgets together when we have to uh, do this on an annual basis. First of all, we start with a set of budget principles that we identified and articulated uh, about three years ago and worked with the local budget committee. We have a budget committee that helps us as we put our budgets together, review uh, especially big picture items with, and one of them is, is what, on what principles do we build our budget. These sound very much like what you heard from Iowa and Iowa State. First and foremost is to focus on the success of our students and invest in their success and the long-term health of our, our university. Out of that then really flows everything else, but we do need to honor our processes of shared governance on this campus and other bargaining units uh, that are so essential to the operation of especially uh, a university like the University of Northern Iowa. We also want to ensure transparency. It means being open with uh, how we put these budgets together and inclusive of ideas. It's why we put together a budget committee that includes representation from across the campus as we build the budget. Uh, and finally, we want to ensure that all of our investments, reductions when they're needed, reallocations are strategic and not sort of off the cuff, um, but they really are strategic and are seen as investments and not simply allocations. There we go. As we put this year's budget together, uh, what we have is a, a general fund balance that is an increase of $267,000 or two tenths of 1%, uh, well below the consumer price index, the inflationary rate that we are seeing at the moment. Uh, we, uh, as we mentioned before, we have, uh, we want to honor faculty and staff salary increases. This year we are looking at uh, increases uh, in both United Faculty and AFSCME, which are bargained um, uh, salary increases of 1.3% this year and next year. Uh, it's 1.3% for the United Faculty, 1% increase for our hourly employees and AFSCME. We'll have a 1.3% increase as well for our professional and scientific uh, employees. Uh, our vice presidents uh, will receive a 1.5% increase, and just a note on that, last year they received no increase at all while other employees did, and all four of them took a voluntary 5% one-time pay cut last year as well, which we greatly appreciated in managing the budget. Um, so they will see a, a slightly larger percentage increase this year. Um, furthermore, um, uh, our commitment to student success is uh, uh, brought forward in the fact that we increased our student financial aid budget by 1.5% in this budget, even though uh, the total increase is only two tenths of a percent. Uh, the financial aid budget will increase by 200, over $274,000 this year. Just an update on sort of the COVID numbers uh, uh, that impact our budget. Uh, during the past year, a little over a year, we've had a total loss of revenue and increased costs due to the response of COVID of uh, $39.62 million. Uh, Eight million of that is in response costs and uh, 31.62 is in lost revenue to the university. Offsetting that uh, cost to the university is about $34.3 million in expense reductions and federal and state aid. Um, uh, there's $11 million in expense reductions, and then the federal and state aid makes up the rest of it, uh, about $22 million, almost $23 million. The net financial impact, net financial impact, is a loss of $5.32 million to the university. And uh, we've been able to, to manage that um, carefully this year, but have made it through. But without the federal and, and state aid, it would have been an impossible task. So we really appreciate uh, that. I want to talk just a little bit about the Higher Learning Commission's accreditation because, as I said in our budget, first and foremost, we focus and invest in the success of our students. And the HLC report that you heard about this morning 
accentuates the fact that we really have made these critical investments in improving the quality of education and being able to document that improvement. That's what an accreditation visit is really all about. Are you doing the things that you say you're doing and are you improving on the education that's delivered? Um, this was a, a unique process because normally a site visit team comes and visits on our campus, but COVID was in place, so only one individual came instead of the whole team, and they did a virtual visit. They visited in March, and we were approved in June. That's an unusually quick time frame. But they told us that was because it was an extremely clean review. Um, the documentation that they had access to was exactly what they needed to see it. It was in great form, and what they were seeing spoke volumes about the quality of this institution. They um, called out numerous strengths, and I'll just go through a few of those. The strong graduation rates compared to our peers, we typically run uh, in four and six year graduation rates, about eight to 10 percentage points above institutions that admit a similar quality of student. Uh, we're developing a new general education program, and it's designed around student learning outcomes and not about disciplines, but what are the learning outcomes that students need when they leave a university with a four-year degree. Uh, the strength of our community engagement, really, which really is a best practices nationally, um, especially through our service learning institutes, and then significant and commendable work, uh, that's their phrase, on the program review and assessment that we take review of our programs and the assessment of those programs, use those assessments to actually make improvements in those programs. We take that very, very seriously and we document that work so that outsiders can see what we have done to make progress in improving that. The evaluators, evaluators also noted that UNI uh, has worked to ensure both undergraduate and graduate students have positive learning outcomes, which is an important part of the assessment work that we do. Also, this morning you heard a, an update on community colleges and the work that the region institutions do with community colleges. And we've spoken about you and I at DMAC before and it was mentioned a little bit earlier. We signed just last month an agreement um, with uh, Haw Hawkeye Community College as well as the Waterloo Community School Districts, which is at a whole new level of articulation agreements. Typically, articulation agreements are between community colleges and four-year institutions. This is a unique articulation agreement in that it is an articulation with a community college, a region institution, and a high school. And what we have created in this partnership is a pathway for students who are in um, uh, the Waterloo's career, Waterloo Community Schools Career Center in manufacturing, in construction, and in graphic technology. As high school students, they will be taking, and the courses are articulated for them, courses that will count for community college credit in those fields. And will be able to transfer directly into the community college. Two of these degrees, the manufacturing and construction uh, degrees, um, are part of the workforce development last dollar scholars program. So as they move to Hawkeye, they will have no costs. All of those courses that they took in high school that count for community college credit are articulated along with the courses they take at Hawkeye Community College into programs at the University of Northern Iowa. So a student as a sophomore in high school will see a path to a high school diploma, to a two-year degree, to a four-year degree if they choose to follow that entire path. It is a unique program. As I said, we've just signed that agreement this summer, just a month ago but it goes into place for this summer. So it is something that we're very proud of, the partnership that we have with Jane Lindeman, the superintendent of the Waterloo Community School Districts, Todd Holcomb at um, uh, Hawkeye Community College, and then so many people here on this campus that really made that work happen. It's a next step in um, connections with community colleges, but also with our school districts. With that, I want to say thank you, but I want to point out one last thing. I just received word, um, you know, June 30 is the end of the um, fiscal year for everything. Uh, a year ago, I was in front of you and told you that we set a new record. Our foundation set a new record in fundraising. We'd raised $38 million, and that was 10% above what we had raised uh, our previous high, which had, had been five or six years ago. 
this year, um, they haven't completely closed the books, but um, at this point, um, they know that they've raised at least $41.5 million, another 10% increase in fundraising for the year. So uh, since we're sitting in the building that houses the foundation and our fundraisers, I wanted to make sure we shout out to, to um, Jim Germeyer and, and the team and the foundation and all of our college deans and, and everybody across this campus for the great work they've done in raising uh, private funds for this institution. It is a high watermark for us and, and just a tremendous, tremendous uh, accomplishment for everybody in the foundation and within each of the colleges and various support um, uh, programs in raising this money. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any of the questions that you have. Questions for President Hucker? Thank you. Thank you, President Hucker. I'm about to recognize Brad Burke again. It's a one-man show today. Um, Thank you. This morning, uh, we received bids on behalf of the University of Iowa Hospital System for two bond refinancings, and Emily. Apprentice will be joining us via Zoom uh, here is very shortly with the results of the, the bid openings. Hi, Emily. Can you? Can you hear me, Emily? Well, while we're working on that, uh, maybe I should, uh, I made an error here. We need to go back and approve the university budgets so that it'll give us a little time to get this operating, okay? Uh, I, I, I think the universities would like that if they, we <laughs> probably went through that step, you know, and just, okay. Uh, a motion and a second are required to approve the budget as outlined in the agenda item. Is there a motion? I so move. Re Regent Bates and Regent Dunkel seconded. Any discussion? We'll have a roll call vote. Regent Barker? Yes. Regent Bates? Yes. Regent Butker? Yes. Regent Crow? Yes. Regent Dakovich? Yes. Regent Dunkel. Yes. Regent Rouse. Yes. Regent Lindemeyer. Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion is approved. That was probably because I interrupted you at the wrong time. No, Mr. that President. was because I made a mistake. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, now I'd like to recognize Brad Burke. Okay, Emily, can you hear us now? I can. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, this is Emily Apprentice with the uh, results of this morning bid openings on behalf of the University of, the University of Iowa Hospital System. Emily? Great, thank you so much. Good afternoon, um, Board of Regents. It's my pleasure to present to you the results of the financing um, and the competitive bid process that was completed this morning. Um, as you know, we went out with two series of bonds, the series 2021A bonds that um, were issued to refinance the board's 2011A and 2011 bonds for interest rate savings, as well as to issue some new money for some capital projects of the hospital and clinics. Um, the total par amount of that issue is $112,345,000. We received eight bids. The winning bidder was Wells Fargo with a TIC of 2.02%. The refinancing resulted in net present value savings of 11.3% or just over $3.3 million on a net present value um, basis. We next went out with a competitive bid for the series 2021B note. 
Um, this is a 13 month note that was issued on a taxable basis in advance of the call date on the series 2012 bonds. As you know, this is a two part financing. We're gonna be taking out the short term note next year with a long term financing on a tax exempt basis. Um, we received six bids. Um, the winning bid was um, JP Morgan at a true interest cost of 0.22%. Um, the par amount of this issue was 148,725,000. So together, the two series of bonds um, were issued at $261,070,000. With that, I'll answer any questions. I'm sorry, what was the rate on the second one? 0.22%. Okay. Which was, a, again, a 13 month note. Any other questions? What was the cover on each one of those? Yeah. Sure. So for the bonds, the cover was very tight. Um, the second bid was a 2.2. It actually goes out to the fourth decimal here. So it's a 2.253. The winning bid was a 2. I rounded up. It's, it was a 2.0180. So um, less than a basis point between the winning bid and the cover bid on the bonds. Um, to give you another data point, between the, the high and the low bid was about 22 basis points on the bond. For the note, um, the cover bid was 0.25. The span between the high and the low was, was even wider here with the, with the um, obviously the winning bid was 0.22. The, um, the, the low bid or not winning bid was a 0.60. So um, a wide span in, in bids on the, on the note. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Now don't go to sleep during this. This is a long one. <clears throat> a motion and a second are required to approve a resolution providing for the sale and authorizing and providing for the issuance and securing the payment of one hundred and twelve million three hundred forty five thousand hospital revenue and refunding bonds series SUI twenty twenty one A and one hundred and forty eight million seven hundred and twenty five thousand hospital revenue refunding bonds appreciation notes series SUI twenty 21B for the purpose of defeasing and current refunding the hospital revenue bonds series SUI 2011 defeasing and current refunding the hospital revenue bonds series SUI 2011A defeasing and advance refunding the hospital revenue bonds series SUI 2012 paying a portion of the costs of construction equipping installing and extended extended certain hospital and clinic facilities related to the hospital system of the State University of Iowa and paying costs of issuance. Is there a motion? Motion. Regent Dokovich? Second. Regent Dunkel? She got there first. Any discussion? Regent Dokovich? We'll yes. have a roll call vote. Regent Dokovich. Yes. Regent Dunkel. Yes. Regent Crow. Yes. Regent Bates. Yes. Regent Lindemeyer. Yes. Regent Butker. Yes. Regent Barker. Yes. Regent Rouse. Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion is approved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all that effort and work, too. I know that's been a long one. Thank you very much.
At this time, I'd like to recognize uh, Brooks Jackson and Suresh Gunasakaran from the UIHC. Uh, they will uh, discuss the UIHC Employee Success Sharing Program. Good afternoon, uh, Regents. Uh, I'm going to have uh, Suresh Gunasakaran, our CEO of uh, UIHC, uh, give some uh, brief presentation on the success sharing program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good to be with all of you. Um, uh, the bond uh, financing results were very, very favorable. We're very grateful for your support of that. Uh, I had the same question Regent Barker did. Um, <laughs> Brooks and I both asked, was it really 0.22? Um, we will have to ask them where the remaining 0.1 went. Um, but uh, sometimes you, you can't win them all. Uh, I do want to preface this success sharing discussion with the fact that this program was developed in a different time and a different day. Uh, if you can go back to um, last year in April and May is when we started thinking about this. Um, the uh, University of Iowa Healthcare was under significant economic stress. Uh, we had finished um, the single most financially destructive month of our history where we had lost over $30 million uh, in one single month um, as uh, the healthcare industry reeled with uh, the COVID pandemic and saw a substantial reduction in services. So as we went into the development of the budget for this fiscal year, there was profound uncertainty. We were unclear as to what the federal support would be. We were unclear um, as to uh, what it would take for us to continue to serve Iowans uh, with the respect and, and standard that was expected. And so with, uh, with Regent support, we obviously developed a budget that included proactive cost-saving measures. And those cost-saving measures were founded on one principle, that regardless of the cost-saving measures that we would look at, that our number one goal throughout this entire period of time was to maintain full employment, that there would be no layoffs. That was going to be off the table regardless of what the headwinds were. And so we made a budget that assumed full employment. If you'll recall at that time, numerous healthcare systems, including healthcare systems within the state of Iowa, were announcing layoffs as we were developing budgets. Some of these layoffs were permanent layoffs, some of these were temporary layoffs, but we knew that something had to be done, but it did not fit our culture, it did not fit our mission. Uh, to participate in layoffs. So we uh, developed an alternate cost-saving strategy. Keep in mind, some of the traditional cost-saving strategies were not going to be available to us. You can't save money on supplies when you're paying so much more for supplies to make sure that your staff has the best available PPE during the pandemic. So we had to go look at labor costs. And what we determined with your support was that some of the cost-saving measures were going to be a 90-day hiring freeze, so that even though we had open positions, positions that we needed, that we were going to delay in hiring of those positions in, in, in order to preserve the jobs of those that were already employed by us. We uh, imposed a, a vacation give-back program so that um, some of the earned vacation was given back to the institution. And, uh, and also, we had a... Um, uh, unpaid uh, 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 week program where uh, folks were uh, required to um, either, based on their um, income, either uh, do one week of unpaid time or two weeks of unpaid time, where uh, essentially they would be away from the institution and not uh, able to use their vacation during that time, which uh, provided us a cost saving. So um, during that period of time, we did not know if those cuts would be sufficient um, to get to a break-even budget. Um, and at that time, we understood that our number one goal was to support those staff, support that faculty that were on the front lines of fighting the pandemic. So it only seemed appropriate if we were asking these frontline workers to make these sacrifices that we ask for permission to do a unique one-time program that is relevant during a pandemic and we instituted a success sharing program that said, hey, if we do get to the end of the year and um, we do have positive financial success, 
one of the obligations we will have at the end of that year is to uh, provide a, an economic um, uh, bonus program, an economic one-time payment, if you will, for our staff. And um, what I will tell you is that uh, obviously we've reached the end of that year. And uh, because we just did some recent uh, bond refinancing that you have just heard about, we were able to talk to S&P and Moody's about how the year has gone for other healthcare systems across the country that have the same um, uh, bond rating that we do. And it's in their uh, ratings documents that can be found publicly, but I'll just summarize it for you. The majority of hospital systems that are of our size and scope and have the same bond rating uh, finish the year on average with a 1% operating margin. Um, I'm happy to report to you that we have finished the year with a 6 to 7% operating margin. We have defied the odds. We have beaten our peer group. Um, this is what uh, unexpected success um, uh, allows us to fund this one-time success sharing program. The documents in front of you provide the details of that success sharing program. At the beginning of the year, the success sharing program was predicated on the operating margin of uh, the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics. And uh, the highest level of success sharing was if we were to reach the 7% operating margin. Um, I've learned a few things along the year, but what I will say is that we really, truly have unprecedented success over this last year, and it's because of the strength and the will of our people and uh, the support of our community, the support of our regents. Um, we were able to achieve this um, margin uh, against great odds and certainly puts us in a minority of health systems. But it also, for the purposes of the success sharing approval that I'm asking you, uh, allows us to reach the highest level of success sharing that we could have anticipated when we developed the program a year ago. And so uh, this will affect all of our staff. Um, all of our staff will um, uh, that uh, have been employed um, uh, when the program was initiated will be eligible for um, the success sharing program. And uh, the details are in uh, the document. Uh, but all of the um, um, revenue, uh, all of the funds for this uh, one-time payment will obviously come from uh, the results of hospital operations. Uh, that's all I have, and I request approval of the uh, ability to pay on the success sharing program. Happy to take any questions. Are there questions at, the, are there questions at this time? Regent Barger? Um, I just want to say I worried uh, about some of those decisions uh, last spring, summer, it's very clear you made the right calls, and uh, I, I'm really impressed and doing the right thing here. So I just want to say congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to say that too, Suresh. First of all, I was was a little conflicted of having a health care layoff during a health crisis, but uh, I think you you just mentioned the economic you just mentioned the economic issues. You also did a my opinion, a fantastic job of dealing with the health and the emotional welfare of your employees. And it really wasn't talked about today. I want to thank you and congratulate you for that. Uh, Regent Dunkel. I just want to throw my congratulations on top of that, too, because those were tough decisions. And when you think back at how emotionally we were all into that. Um, you know, that affects your employees, and you know, God bless you for making the right decision here today, too. I'd like to point out that uh, UIHC is the backstop hospital for every hospital in the state. There was, there is no alternative uh, for uh, a backstop other than to make the place operate efficiently and effectively and and take the cases that couldn't be handled by the other hospitals that needed their expertise. So uh, with Brooks' uh, guidance and Suresh's uh, efforts, I, 
we worried a lot, and, uh, but it uh, did a great job, and we appreciate it. And we, we thank the employees who made it happen, who often were working double and triple shifts, and hard to, uh, it's hard to describe where we were last year. It is, and I appreciate you saying that because um, Brooks and I know that um, it is great to be able to have a program where we set a goal, we achieve the goal, but the goal has come at a heavy price and it, will, it is one that we will continue to invest in. Our staff is still tired. Our staff, uh, we need to continue to invest in that, in overall wellness, in overall um, ability to, to deal with this kind of peak workload. We have a lot of recruitment efforts underway to augment the staff and other things because we finished the year in positive health, we can do those things. So this is not the only thing that we will do for the staff. We know that there is more that needs to be done. And because we were able to manage our finances, we will be able to fund many of those um, investments. But I do appreciate um, the board's comments. It is extremely uh, gratifying um, to be in this situation, but uh, the work is not done. And um, I, I think there is still more that we will need to do for our staff and more that we'll have to do for the state because uh, I do believe there's more left to the pandemic. And uh, as, Re uh, as President Richards uh, mentioned, uh, this fall will require significant diligence on the parts of everyone. Uh, we will be uh, helping all community partners in spearheading their vaccination efforts. There is still a tremendous opportunity for us to affect the future of Iowa by encouraging um, vaccination in a timely manner. Any other comments? A motion and a second are required to approve the payment to the University of Iowa healthcare employees as outlined in the docket memo. Is there a motion? So move. Second. Regent Lindemeyer. Second. Regent Bates. A second by Regent Bates. Any discussion? We'll have a roll call vote. Regent Dokovich? Yes. Regent Dunkel? Yes. Regent Crow? Abstain. And I might explain that Regent Crow is a employee at the University Hospitals and has asked to abstain. She's she's not opposed to the program. Uh, Regent Bates? Yes. Regent Lindemeyer? Yes. Regent Butker? Yes. Regent Barker? Yes. Regent Rouse? Yes. Regent Richards votes yes. The motion is approved. Thank you very much. At this time, I'd uh, like to recognize Amy Clays, who is, uh, will give an overview and introduce the presenters. And the presenters can join me at the table now as well. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. Um, so as you all know, effective July 1st, the NCAA adopted an interim policy suspending rules regarding name, image, and likeness rights for all current and incoming student athletes. This action enables the student athletes at the region's institutions uh, to take advantage of name, image, and likeness opportunities to their benefit. Now, during this time, the Regent Universities have been working to provide access to educational resources for their student athletes on name, image, and likeness rights and opportunities. And we've invited athletics representatives today to provide the board with an update on those efforts. And so presenting first will be the University of Iowa uh, Deputy Director of Athletics, Barbara Burke. Go ahead, thank Barbara. You. Yes, thank you, Amy. 
Uh, thank you, board, for having us. And um, the information I'd like to share with you today has been so critical and important to the growth of our student athletes. It really be began back in the fall of 2020 um, when we realized there was NIL legislation coming down the path. And so it was important to begin to prepare as early as possible. And in doing so, we created an NIL working group on the campus. Individual members of our athletic department participate currently still participate in the working group, and we have a wonderful collaboration with the university as a whole. Some of the members that participate in the working group come from athletics compliance, marketing, trademark and licensing, sport representatives, and also alumni. The university as a whole participates through the College of Law, our sport and rec management department, the Tippy College of Business, and the UI Center for Advancement. Those partnerships have been really critical in developing the policy that we now have at the University of Iowa. The purpose of the group was number one, to establish the overarching policy, which we have and it's functioning and it's out there for our student athlete coaches and staff review. The other part of this is the education, the monitoring, and the tracking of all NIL activities. In, additional, they, in addition, they've assisted us in identifying resources, reviewing local, state, and federal guidelines, and also assisting us in developing educational sessions for all of our staff members. Some of those sessions will include and already are including entrepreneurship, financial literacy like taxes, intellectual property rights, wealth management and licensing on behalf of our student athletes, personal branding and social media strategies, personnel and career training opportunities, and very important agent and advising um, initiatives and education on behalf of our student athletes. So that all took place in the fall of 2020. Then in the spring of 21, we began to have those educational sessions based upon our policies and information that we had at the time, understand all of this was going on before the NIL legislation was even launched on July 1. So some of it was speculation, some of it was following what was going on around the country. So we began to have team meetings conducted by members of the group, and the education delivery models were in person, online, and moving forward as we learn more about NIL legislation and where it's going, we plan to have speaker panels, hopefully student athletes that have engaged in NIL activities and other individuals that can come in and share their personal experiences. We're too early in the process to be able to do that right now, but that's some of the future education that we plan to provide. What was really important was reaching our student athletes where they are and how do you communicate with the total body of student athletes when they're all over um, the, the country, they're in class, they're doing online education. Uh, fortunately, we wanted to create a one-stop shop for our athletes, if you will, and it began with a program called Teamworks. You may be familiar with it. It's a broad-based communication tool that we had already been using in our athletic department. It, provided, it provides our athletes a place to go to click on one button when they get into Teamworks. We then partnered with a company called Influencer. And Influencer, again, is a broad-based app that creates additional opportunities for our um, student athletes to enhance and utilize all of the NIL options that are out there. The one thing that intrigued us about Influencer, so we partner with Teamworks, Influencer partnered with Teamworks, so now we have that opportunity. Um, as NIL was beginning to strategize, the influencer company added um, an app called Verified. And that really sold us on that was the direction we needed to go because it was one place that our staff and student athletes could go. The influencer Verified app is really a compliance monitoring opportunity that allows our student athletes, number one, they can go in and they put their own NIL activities into the app. Our um, compliance staff has immediate access to all of the activities that our student athletes are participating. Now the onus is on the student athletes to report their activities. Once they report their activities, then our staff can help guide, direct, monitor them. The other positive thing about the Influencer Verified app is if our student athletes engage with outside representation, a marketing assistant, if you will, an agent, marketing agent, they can act on behalf of the student athlete and they can input information into this app as well. So it's really stream, streamlined the activity, if you will. Um, for our student athletes, it's, it's been a very important part of our education process. A couple things that go into the Influencer Verified app 
they have education components. They provide education podcasts that are national podcasts from individuals that are currently participating in NIL activities. It also provides third party vendors to participate that can encourage our students to, to take part in other activities that might be available to them. Um, there's a couple segments within the Verified app. It's called Storyteller Playbook. It provides additional educational um, videos and text resources. Athletes have the ability to get real-time content access, what's happening around the country, what are other student athletes doing, participating in. And it also allows them to look at their own personal social media and receive analytics back from the company. That's very important for us. Um, so it's very important that we have the automated reporting and self-reporting activities that our student athletes do. And then finally, so it was, it was in the fall of 20 and then the spring of 21 and now July 1 of 2021, we have NIL legislation. On that day, we launched the Hawkeye Flight Program, which is a cross-departmental effort that creates and oversees the NIL activities and educational pro programming for all of our Hawkeye student athletes. The flight programming provides our athletes the opportunity to ask questions, to understand, to know what their rights are, and to capitalize on their name, image, and likeness. Um, as with anything, this is very new. We're not even to August 1st. We're learning every day. Our athletes are learning every day. And this will be a very fluid program and change as the landscape of intercollegiate athletic changes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, just why don't we hold the questions to the end and then we can just you know, maybe you'll pick and choose whoever wants to answer it. Go ahead. All right, presenting next is Iowa State University Faculty Athletics Representative Tim Day. Go ahead, Yeah, Tim. well, th thank you, President Richards and uh, Director Braun and the rest of the regents. Thanks for the opportunity for, to present to you our kind of map for how we're going to provide NIL education to our student athletes in this new agent. It's kind of, there's going to be a lot of repeat stuff here because it sounds like we follow a lot of the same patterns. Um, we, we are really excited about the opportunities that present themselves to our student athletes, but with these kind of newfound opportunities, there are some new wrinkles to the kind of support that we need to provide to our student athletes. And all of our institutions work really hard and really fervently to try to provide for, to try to facilitate the success of our student athletes in, in every aspect, in their personal growth, in their academic accomplishments, and, and certainly also in their, in their athletic pursuits. And so we'll add to that this, this new responsibility of helping them to navigate this, this new opportunity that they, that they have in front of them, that is the monetization of name, image, and likeness. And, and like the University of Iowa, we, we started our efforts with a working group a long time ago that included student athletes and coaches and athletics administrators and operations people, compliance people, university council and, and faculty, and, and started really with the idea, as, as Barbara said, w without a real clear idea of what the landscape would look like, but knowing that this was coming, that this was on the horizon. And certainly, David, who sits on the Division I Council, Gary sits on the Council, they knew what, that this was, this was definitely in the pike. So as, as we all prepared for that, we, we thought two things were important as we started. That is to identify what, what are our needs as an institution. We may be different from everybody else in some other ways, so we wanted to kind of look at ourselves, not let the market tell us, not let everybody else tell us what we needed to do to prepare. Listen, but kind of look at ourselves. And, and also, just to start communication, because really communication within the athletics department and throughout the institution, we're just going to be critical to facilitating success for our student athletes in these spaces. Informed, open communication between the trademark office and, and university council and our student athletes and our administrators and, and coaches, and we needed to kind of set that groundwork for informed, open communication. And, and as we did that and, and, and worked with our with our student athletes and with our coaches and with our university, we found four areas that we thought we, we need to kind of add this to our repertoire of how we support our student athletes. And those were some of the very same things that, that Barbara mentioned, that is firstly uh, in this area of, of entrepreneurship that student athletes would have some entrepreneurial opportunities that weren't there for them previously. Secondly, in the area of kind of learning to, to manage and think about their personal brand and their image. Thirdly, in some areas of learning to read and understand contracts in some ways that they hadn't previously been kind of asked to do. And then, and then lastly, 
make sure that they understand the reporting requirements to meet institutional obligations, to meet NCA obligations, and then obviously even to meet IRS obligations. So in each of those, there's kind of a little bit, I'll try to walk through them really quickly, but in the entrepreneurial space, you know, you all know that we have really robust entrepreneurial education opportunities at Iowa State University within the, the Debbie and Jerry Ivey College of Business. And, and building on that Papa John uh, presence that's there and programs like Sci Starters, which are 11 week summer programs to help students in general learn things about entrepreneurship and, and then even get some things started if they want to in that space. And, and this is a, an example, I think, of something we see as a win-win, right? So, so previously, student athletes had, had some limitations on their ability to participate in entrepreneurial activities. Now their appetite is wet by these new opportunities that they have, and we need to marry them with existing uh, resources that we have already on our campus. And, and that's win-win. There's no, there's no bad outcome from our student athletes learning uh, some of the basics of entrepreneurship and kind of getting their appetite set in those places. Secondly, in, in this space of of uh, personal brand development and management. It, you know, we do have expertise in marketing on our campus, but much like the University of Iowa sees these external, pro, these external service providers like Influencer, they are, they are focused and digging deep and hard and aggressive and understanding student, athlete, brand and image. And, and we all know that, that certainly uh, for our student athletes, their ability to monetize their name, image, and likeness depends on people's perception of them. It depends on their character, but in today's world, it also depends a lot on how they present themselves in social media. And companies like Influencer, they work full time in this space. And so we actually just started, a, uh, an R, not started, we're almost across the finish line with an RFP process to analyze the different companies that could provide that. Influencers certainly right in that mix. They're a great company doing awesome work in that space. Um, but, but we're gonna provide that external support for our student athletes as well in terms of helping them develop their, their brand. And, and again, this is win-win. You know, there, there's no bad side to our student athletes or any student starting to think today about how they present themselves on social media affects their lives and the way people perceive them, maybe their employment opportunities in the future, and certainly even today, how marketable are they as an endorser of products. So, so providing them education in those spaces is really critical to their success. And then also reading contracts. Again, this is a task that not a lot of college students are, are in the business of doing, some are, but now that our student athletes can sign this, we really owe them, we have a responsibility to help educate them, educate them on the basics of reading and understanding contracts, and also then when to kind of pull the ripcord and say, I actually need someone, I need to pay someone to review this contract and make sure that this is appropriate. And, and the influencer and those companies or the external platforms provide a lot of context-specific education in those kinds of spaces, and that's one of the things that we're, we're analyzing with the RFP. We have all the results in on that, or all the bids are in, and, and we're still analyzing which fits us. And, and, and to move into that, the last one, that is a reporting requirement, we actually developed our own platform for student athletes to, to report their NIL activity, and we've been really pleased with it. We thought that we would probably run to an external service provider quickly, but we're finding our student athletes responding really well to the platform that we provided. They can do it on their phone. They're doing it readily, um, and they are, uh, you know, it, it, there's a lot of platform fatigue for, for our students in general and student athletes as well. And so the fact that they can do that right within, we've actually got that within Teamworks. We also use Teamworks and, and that's gone pretty well for us. And we're getting information that, that we think is really helpful and is not available to us in a couple of the other platforms and what they provide. So we may end up not using some of the compliance platforms that are part of that RFP. So those are the areas that we're really focused on. We're focused on entrepreneurship and helping them in those spaces, helping our students athletes, helping our student athletes to understand how they can build their brand and develop their own brand and image, how they can read and understand contracts. Again, there's nothing bad about it. This is a great opportunity to have our student athletes now interested in this, whatever they choose to do in their lives, the, the, the ability to read and understand contracts, it, it's great that now they're motivated and we're here to help them do that. And we have those facilities or that, that capacity to do that. So those are the areas that we have focused our efforts and our student athletes are kind of just now coming back and starting to kind of engage in that stuff. And it is a learning process. We will have to kind of, we're gonna to have to learn as we go on this, but th that's where our efforts are focused right now.
Thank you, Tim. Presenting next is University of Northern Iowa Director of Athletics, David Harris. Go ahead, Dave. Thank you uh, to President Richards and, and to all of the regents. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to uh, speak about our efforts at the University of Northern Iowa. Many of my comments will echo comments that have been made by my colleagues. Uh, we're all in a very similar space in that this is ultimately a new frontier uh, for many of us. Uh, but it's an exciting area. I think uh, student athletes have been talking about this for a while, and we've been talking about this as an industry uh, for a while. The opportunity to monetize name, image, and likeness uh, with our student athletes, and it's finally come to fruition. Uh, but it has been planned for for a number of years, as you've heard mentioned uh, by Barbara and, and by Tim. Uh, we have been talking about this at least for the past couple of years, but really uh, prior to that, the idea of doing this and the possibility of it coming down the road has been something that's been talked about in the industry. And the really, uh, the only own unknown piece of it was exactly what was it going to look like? Uh, because we've all been trying to get our arms around what the rules would be, what the restrictions would be, uh, so that we could educate our student athletes and make sure that we implemented this uh, appropriately. And so Tim mentioned that I've had the opportunity along with Gary to sit on the NCAA Division I Council. And so from my perspective, just by way of background, uh, one of the things that I can offer is that through the majority uh, of the previous year, uh, we had a legislative solutions group that worked uh, within the NCA that was working to put forward a proposal on what name, image, and likeness would look like from the NCAA standpoint. And so for many of us, it was trying to make sure that we were in tune with what that policy was going to be and begin to make preparations in that area. It was our expectation that this was gonna be, in some ways, handed down to us from the NCAA based on the information that was being gathered and provided and disseminated to all of us based on the recommendation that came from the Legislative Solutions Group. But ultimately, at the beginning of 2021, we took a different direction, uh, and it was decided that they were not going to uh, vote on that proposal. Uh, and they began to work uh, to make uh, adjustments to the proposal to make sure that it fit the current environment and the current landscape of collegiate athletics. Ultimately, what we found out just a couple of months ago uh, is that the NCA would ultimately delegate uh, the authority in NIL to state laws uh, and then to institutions if your state didn't have a law. And so for many of us, uh, we went from preparing to accept and to implement policy that was going to be dictated by the NCA to looking at how can we craft our own policy and how can we do things uh, that are institution specific, especially if you're in a state uh, that did not have a state law that would dictate how things were going to operate. Uh, as you might expect, the states that do have laws in this area, they can vary greatly in how this is going to be administered. Uh, and so for us in the state of Iowa, once it was decided that this is the way that it was going to be handled, uh, we all had to make sure that we had a policy that made sense on our campus uh, for our student athletes that took the basic tenets of what the NCA has intended uh, and the basic tenets of what they felt like were important uh, and the things that needed to be prohibited and make sure that we implemented that within our policy. But other than that, uh, we were trying to give, and we're continuing to try to give, maximum flexibility to our student athletes. Uh, we're in a space where they have an opportunity to do something new, to do something that's beneficial to them and to their families. And so ultimately, we did not want to have uh, any more rules than we felt like were absolutely necessary. We wanted to give them a framework, but really to concentrate on the educational component. Uh, not so much these are the things that you can't do, but here's how you can do certain things correctly. How, here's how you can do things uh, within the rules and within the spirit of what we feel like is important. Uh, and so because we knew that this was coming but didn't necessarily understand the format, we began having conversations just like Iowa, just like Iowa State during 2020 with our student athletes, with our coaches, with our staff, uh, beginning to make preparation, talking about what we thought the needs would be 
uh, with the educational components would be, uh, and much like my colleagues, we knew that we wanted to focus not just on the rules and laws around NIL, but looking at this from a bigger picture, understanding that our student athletes were gonna have a chance to go into business for themselves, so to speak. And if you're in that position, uh, then understanding how to be an entrepreneur, understanding taxes, uh, understanding credit, understanding contracts, uh, having access to a financial advisor, someone who can help you make decisions, all of those things that they have not had an opportunity to be able to do, we knew that that needed to be a broader focus of what our educational uh, efforts were going to be. Uh, and so as we got into the spring and got into the summer and the July 1st deadline came up, we sent an email to all of our student athletes making sure that they understood that these were the institution specific uh, policies or rules that they needed to abide by. Uh, and they were fairly basic and they were really keeping in line with what the NCA uh, has asked us to focus on, no pay for play, uh, access to a financial advisor, uh, if you're going to be using the marks of the university, then going through and getting the appropriate permission uh, to be able to do those things. Uh, but we wanted to keep it uh, fairly small, uh, fairly concise, um, because we wanted them to be able to consume it and understand it and then be able to implement it. And so for us, as we go into the start of the school year, we're going to be taking those bullet points and putting them into a formal policy uh, that will be implemented because, as my colleagues mentioned, we're still learning. We're still gathering information. The landscape continues to change, uh, and we will have something that we will disseminate to them again uh, at that particular time. Uh, as Tim mentioned, a big component uh, of our education is going to be through a third-party administrator that's going to help us. Uh, as I mentioned before, when we were looking at doing this nationally, there was a time when the NCA was actually considering a national third party administrator uh, to be able to help. But now that that's not occurring, uh, each of us are looking at what your needs are on your campus and what you feel like uh, is in the best interest to fit the needs of your student athletes. And so uh, at the University of Northern Iowa, we're really planning to hit hard on the educational component. Uh, and we have looked at a number of different entities that do this work. We actually uh, just had a presentation yesterday, uh, so we're considering which one we feel will be best for us. Uh, the basic components, though, that we want to look at uh, are the education, uh, the, the monitoring, uh, and then the reporting of it. So uh, we're looking at having a website and an app uh, that will provide much of the same type of information. Being able to have a company that provides information or allows us to be able to upload information that we create that talks about a number of these areas. So if you're looking at contracts or choosing a financial advisor or all the different things that go into starting your business, then you can go into the app, you can access that information, and that can supplement the education that we're going to be providing as a university. Because as our student athletes come back, they all typically, and I know it's the same at the other universities, you have beginning of the year compliance meetings where you talk about these things, uh, you talk about what the landscape is, you talk about a number of different areas. So NIL uh, will be a big focus of that for us. So we will be providing information about what our institution policy is going to be, but ultimately also pointing them toward this information that'll be able to give them more precise information and answer their questions, uh, things that we can work with the company to be able to upload, uh, whether they are videos or articles that they can read or the latest information that will come out that will help them understand the rules and also just help them get a perspective that they haven't had before. Uh, and then bringing in speakers to be able to talk about different aspects of this as well. So as we get that online and we're able to work with our coaches and student athletes to make sure that that information is exactly what they need and put in a format that's consumable very quickly that they can understand, uh, we will put that in place along with our institutional educational efforts uh, to make sure that our student athletes know what they're doing, uh, they can make good decisions because for us, this is an exciting new venture for them. We want to make sure that they do it right. We want to make sure that they don't uh, slip up, that they understand exactly uh, how to go about maximizing this opportunity. 
this is something that they've heard about for so long. The last thing that we want uh, is for them to go into this and not understand how to go about doing this the very best uh, to their ability. Uh, and we know that because we have different institutions, not just within the state, uh, but across the country, everybody will likely be doing this a little bit differently. Uh, so, and that's okay. We wanna make sure that even though we'll be different than some of our colleagues, that our student athletes know that their opportunity and their ability to be able to maximize the benefit of this, this new legislation uh, is not gonna be uh, really hindered in any significant way. Uh, we want this to be a good, uh, positive experience for them. And so we wanna make sure that we're giving them all the tools to be able to do this effectively. Uh, so as we continue to work through this, uh, we will use an administrator to be able to help us to provide the information, to help us provide the, the education that we need. They will also help us uh, to be able to do the appropriate monitoring. Uh, so there'll be an ability that uh, within the platform uh, you can go in and answer a series of questions that on our side will be able to help us figure out if they are about to enter into an agreement that has an issue, if it's a conflict of some type with NCA law or rules or something that happens with an institution. They'll have the ability to be able to upload an agreement or a contract so we have a chance to be able to review that. And then we can reach out to them and go over that information. So as they're looking at entering into that agreement, uh, they have a chance to talk with us and make sure that they have all their ducks in a row. And then finally, there'll be a reporting element because we know that there will be questions uh, about uh, exactly how many of your student athletes have entered into an agreement or can you give us that information by sport or can you give us that information by classification? Can you give us the rough amount uh, that these student athletes are earning based on these deals? And we know we need to partner with someone who can give us that information. Uh, so there's a reporting element uh, that we're looking at having as a part of working with this administrator as well. Uh, the last thing that I'll mention, and it's something uh, that some of the conferences are considering, uh, is that the Missouri Valley Conference is also looking at the possibility of whether or not as a conference we want to go in together working with the same administrator, the same educational uh, administrator. And we're actually, we have a working group that's been working on this uh, for the past six or seven weeks and they are presenting a report uh, to the athletics directors within the conference on Friday morning. Uh, and so one of the reasons that we haven't chosen uh, the administrator that we want to work with is because there is a possibility uh, that the conference may decide that we want to go in together and work with the same administrator uh, because there could be some price breaks financially uh, in order to be able to do that. So I look forward uh, to hearing that information and hearing that report on Friday and from there being able to work to make a decision about which entity uh, is the best one for the University of Northern Iowa to provide education to our student athletes uh, and then just continuing to be abreast on changes. We know that this landscape is evolving quickly. We know that the information is coming pretty rapidly. We know what the rules are today may not be the rules by the end of the year. Uh, so nothing about this is static. We expect it to change. Uh, we expect it to be a dynamic environment uh, and we're invested in making sure that we're up on the rules and that we can provide the best educational support to our student athletes. Thank you very much for your time. Questions for, I know I've had a lot of, I, I don't have a lot of questions about your presentation. I've had a lot of questions uh, that people I have asked about this. Uh, Regent yeah, Lindemar. I, I, I feel the same way when you said New Frontier, it's kind of like the wild, wild west, you know. How much guidance has the NCAA provided for you to to uh, set up your own individual guidelines on campus? Because it sounds like the three of you could have three different programs almost. I would just offer from, from my perspective, it's really been minimal. The, the idea is that the NCA is against pay for play. So uh, in no uh, shape do they want institutions uh, involved in setting up NIL deals uh, none of the NIL deals should have a pay-for-play component. 
uh, and they want student athletes to understand that they should have access uh, to someone that can help them with finances and with contracts. Uh, outside of that, that's been the, the really the basic framework. Uh, outside of that, they have left it to the state level and to the institutions to work within that framework and to come up with what they feel is, is best. If, if the university, I'm sorry. Were you I, I would just add to that the one thing that, you know, David knows this stuff far better than I would also that it, these, the NIL deals are not offered as a recruiting inducement. So as one of the, one of the box that our student athletes have to check as they submit their report, it's that this deal was not, uh, no one spoke to me about this or offered this to me before I enrolled at Iowa State and it wasn't used as an inducement to get me to enroll at Iowa State. So that's just one more component of, but past that, as Dave said, the NCAA is basically not giving us a lot of uh, details. In terms of hey, uh, so if the institution signs a contract with an administrator like Influencer, are your athletes then obligated to, to use that platform or can they seek out their own platform if they want? From a reporting standpoint, we would require them to, to go through Teamworks using the Influencer to track their NIL activities. So to answer your question specifically, our expectation is they use those platforms that we provide. And is that platform then aligned somehow with, with IRS reporting so they don't get in trouble? It, it can be, but it's mainly their communication with their financial advisor, their marketing assistant. Um, what I reiterate what David mentioned about our compliance staff having a responsibility to assist in monitor and tracking and educating the student athletes ahead of time so that we can minimize issues that they might have on the back end of a contract, making sure we're on the front end. So it's in the best interest of the student athletes to communicate um, before they get too far into an agreement with an individual or a company or a corporation. Regent Bates. It sounds like, you know, I hear the word education over and over and over. You guys are being educated, everybody is. So how do you handle all the student athletes? Is there a is there an education piece that everybody hears at the very beginning, or is it as the need arises, as they maybe want to partake of something like that? Uh, in our case, some, some of each, and it's a great question. Certainly, we, we believe in our experience on all kinds of onboarding for students and student athletes is, you know, the right context in the right moment is when they learn best, and some of the apps like Influencer will, when you're ready to enter, maybe the, disclose an agreement with an agent, um, with someone who's going to represent you. It can provide you with, well, could you read this? Could you read that? And so provides um, certain educational components at the right moment, but there are certainly also other things that we're going to that we're going to educate all 450 of our student athletes on in August as part of that orientation that David talked about. Mm -hmm. You know, that's part of every, the beginning of every year, there's some compliance moments that we yeah. have with all student athletes and, and this stuff will be included. It won't be that extensive, uh, but otherwise integrated into their, their pathway of learning through, okay. through the entire institution. Thank you. I, I agree. It's, it's about trying to provide a basic level of education for all student athletes, but then one of the important things that I think we're all looking for uh, as we work with different agencies is can you help us customize something that's perhaps by gender, by sport, by classification, uh, because the needs and the opportunities are going to be different. Uh, and so I, I can remember just having a conversation yesterday with an entity where I asked the question, if we wanted to have a particular education, uh, educational module that's uploaded just for a specific team, can we do that? And the answer was yes, and I think that'll be an important thing because uh, there'll be some opportunities that'll be presented to a team or to a student athlete or to, or to a group of student athletes that'll be different uh, and we need to be able to address that. So it's got to be a combination of having something uniform for everyone but also customizable uh, so that those that need a different level of education have an opportunity to be able to get that. Okay. Thank you. Regent Butker. Thank you. Regent Butker. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I'm curious about possible landmines or whatever, um, things that uh, you're thinking about that, I mean, it seems like such a wide open field right now that we can't even pick out what are the possible landmines, if you will, about 
where kids could be fined or, I mean, I don't even know enough of, about it to make a, a really good question, but I, I uh, what are we doing um, to uh, think of ahead uh, possible problems, worst case scenarios for kids to make a bad mistake, what happens? I think from a landmine standpoint, the first thing that comes to mind is that the student athletes need to understand that if you enter into an NIL agreement, you have to fulfill that agreement in order to receive the compensation. Otherwise, you've moved into extra benefit territory and you, you have an NCA violation. Uh, and so if you, uh, if you contract to do an autograph session at your local car dealership, uh, there's an expectation that you go and that you execute that particular agreement. Uh, if you execute the agreement and you receive money and you're not doing the work, uh, then that's no different than right now having a, a job that you don't go to and don't receive uh, the revenue. And so they have to understand that those rules carry over into this environment. It's a new wide open environment, but those rules still apply and that can be a significant landmine uh, for some. Uh, I think the other thing, and, it, and it's been mentioned to this point, when you look at contracts, you're, the contract can have elements that perhaps go against state law, go against institutional policy, and we need to know that before you enter into a contractual agreement uh, that requires that you do something that you really can't do. Uh, and so we are all over our student athletes to make sure that they understand not only do you need to have a representation and a financial advisor, but you need to be in touch with your coaches, your compliance administrators, and your sport administrators so that we can help you avoid a landmine. We can help you to make the right kind of decision so that you can stay out of trouble and that this can be a positive experience instead of one that's punitive for them. I, I think adding to what, what David said, it's important that the athletes know we're here to help support, guide, and direct. We're not, um, it's not a punitive model, it's not a punitive policy, but they need to understand we expect some issues because it's so new. And so we have to be prepared to adjust, be flexible, help our student athletes walk through that and make sure that we're counseling them on getting all the help that they need to navigate NIL. Um, we don't even understand it to this point, honestly, because it is so broad, so we can't expect our student athletes to understand it. So we have to be there for them at that personal level. I, I feel like I just want to weigh in too, because I, I do believe there, you, there's not a boogeyman behind every tree, but there will be some bad actors in this space, and, and our student athletes will do well to, it, it's important, I say to them, it's awesome that you have something that they want, but remember, they want something from you. They're, they're not in this for charity. They're in this because they want something from you. So that's both a warning, it's, but, but it's great. You, you have something they want. So be encouraged by that, but be aware, you know, that be aware. So I, I think there's a, I think our student athletes are pretty savvier than most of us might think, including myself, as I spoke to them. They were, they were pretty aware of what the landscape looked like out there. Regent Barker. Um, just to be sure I understand, when you talk about pay for play, you're talking about recruiting and inducements to come to a particular school, or is it more to it than that? No, it's, it's, it's recruiting inducements, but it's also the, the broader concept that, uh, as we've looked at name, image, and likeness, because student athletes are able to get paid for their NIL, people have associated it pretty closely with just paying student athletes for being student athletes. And so as we moved into the NIL space, we wanted it to be clear that yes, you can be paid for work that you do in this particular area, but that the NCAA is still against the idea of just paying college student athletes for representing universities. So uh, it's really more of a way of just clarifying that that uh, principle that's been a bedrock of the NCA still remains in place. Regent Lindemar. Are, are there restrictions on the type of businesses they can associate with? Um, I'm thinking of 
You see all these ads for sports betting now in those entities. Surely the NCA won't allow them to endorse those or yeah, NCA policies against uh, would would prohibit them from um, um, endorsing banned substances or betting or, or any entities that involve sports books. So, do you have someone at each of the institutions that is just in control of the contracts or the compliance that the contracts are written correctly, or or is that out of your realm? I mean, I, I don't I don't quite understand that. Please. Excuse me. That so piece. for us right now at the University of Iowa, it all flows through our NC2A compliance office and our compliance staff. And you talked about a, a, a landmine where, where I get concerned down the road as more student athletes become comfortable with NIL, more participate than we have right now. Um, the staffing that it may require to monitor and manage all of these activities, not only from a compliance standpoint, but think Think of each institution's licensing and trademark um, department and the approvals that are going to be required for some of the marks and things of that nature. So I think moving forward as the NIL opportunities grow, our student athletes become more familiar. And not only that, the incoming athletes that now they, they're learning and educating on it before they ever get to our campuses. So they're going to get a head start and, and already hit the ground running. So I think that's going to be something that's going to change in the near future, and we're going to have to evaluate the staffing and the monitoring and the tracking. I would, I would agree with that. That's a concern. I would just add in, in that area, our compliance office is going to be doing that, but we're looking at it from a standpoint of is there anything in the contract that's against uh, NCA policy or board policy or university policy or anything involving the use of the marks that you need to get approval from. If it's on its face not a d good deal for you, that's the reason why we want you to have representation. Now, because there are student athletes, if we notice that there's something about it that we think is not the greatest situation, then we're in a position to be able to have those conversations. But ultimately, that's why we encourage student athletes to get their representation because this is their individual enterprise for which they need to have the appropriate representation and they need to have someone that advises them whether or not this is really the best deal for them to sign. That's not ultimately meant to be the, uh, the purpose behind the compliance office. It may be something that we do, as I said, because there are student athletes and we care about them, but that's where, why we really need them to have representation to protect their own interests. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that explanation. Well, thank you. Uh, I think uh, unless there's further questions, I mean, I, I think we all have a lot of questions, but I think you do too because we're just starting this. Uh, we'll probably at some time want to have a follow-up discussion to, that you can help us understand where, we're, where we all land on this. Uh, and uh, we just encourage you to do as good a job as you can and pay attention to which, I, which you are. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate it. Yeah. Is there any other business to, be, to come before this uh, board? This meeting of the Board of Regents, everybody knows I like to, uh, the Re Board of Regents is adjourned.